I'm home. Throws to the near side, and that's intercepted. Intercepted by Jack Jones, heading down the near sideline, and this will be a pick six for Jack Jones and a touchdown for Arizona State. People here, when you think of Sun Devil football, you think of Sun Devil for life. Here we go, seven Going seconds. Deep. Berkovici, he's just going to air it out deep downfield, and uh, no white shirts around. Oh, oh Jalen Strong! Strong. Got the touchdown! Jalen Strong makes the catch! I went to Arizona State! Right. I'm a Sun Devil, man! This is about the Valley. We need the Valley. If we get the Valley all in, the sky is the limit. Welcome to Speak of the Devils, the premier podcast for Sun Devil football. I'm Brad Denny with 3TV. I'm Joe Healy with DevilsDigest.com. Joe, it is the middle of June. Typically a very slow part of the college football calendar, kind of the doldrums, if you will. That's just really not the case these days. Recruiting is picking up for the Sun Devils fast and furious. Uh, the news is coming out that they're adding some big-time names to the Hall of Fame. And, oh, yeah, the uh, baseball season is still kind of you know dying down a little bit. We're trying to figure out what the hell happened there. Yeah, the, uh, the heat is turning up here in Phoenix. I'm looking ahead and... Uh... You know, thanks to my weather app and also my fellow Dobson Ranch OG alum Ian Schwartz, my man, <laughs> turning up the heat in Arizona, and things are turning up as well when it comes to all those topics that you just mentioned. I feel like a broken record saying this every time out here, but uh, yeah, there there's no downtime. This is like unprecedented times. If you think back over the last calendar year about how. Uh, how often there have been things to talk about. Not always good, not always bad, but there's been a lot of content, and we've taken a little bit little bit of a break here. Uh, it's been a couple weeks, been a little while, and on that note, on a personal level, if I may, send a huge shout-out to an adoring listener of ours, my cousin Andrew Velzi. Congratulations on the wedding to his wonderful, beautiful bride, Nicole, who's and officially a member of the family. A lot of folks listening know that uh, my my cousin, more like a brother to me, comes out just about every year for, for an ASU game. He's had some good luck in the past. He's partied with the good folks at Crafty Devils. Had me be a beer boy at the wedding. I don't know if you've seen this sort of thing before, <laughs> Brad Denny, but I hadn't either. Basically, I was equipped with a like holster of... Bottles of American beer that I was giving out after I walked down the aisle. So I had to kind of bring some zing and some pep into the things. Was it more like a holster or was it kind of like a bandolier of, of beers? So it was a waist, oh. yeah, kind of, yes, but it was so it was waist <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> applied, held a full okay. sixer. And so I just walked down the aisle, did a little razzle dazzle, get the people going. Distribute a couple beers. I have my brother in law. I had him as my plant. I'm like, dude, like you got to get up and you got to ask. You got to you got to be ready for one right away because a lot of people are gonna be like, what in the world is going on? It's not a very common thing. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but yeah, it was a good time. And uh, yeah, there'll be uh, photographic and video evidence at some point. So I'm curious to see how that all plan- panned out. It was a great time. But just want to take a moment to send my love and a shout out to the happy couple there. Like I said. Uh, my boy Andrew listens all the time. He's a huge Sun Devil fan out there uh, in the, the New Jersey, Philadelphia area. So all the best to the new couple as we move along here on the show. Absolutely. Uh, so love is in the air and a lot of news in the air. And uh, a lot of uh, guests are in the, are going to be on air on this episode. I, I, I don't know. I mean, outside of like kind of the special episodes where we like talk to the Rose Bowl team, there's like 12 guys. This might be just kind of a, one of the, the higher... Uh, uh, guest count episodes we've had. We have five great guests that will be on this episode joining Joe and I. We're going to talk to a couple Hall of Famers, brand new or newly minted Hall of Famers, and are going to the ASU Hall of Fame. The wide, great wide receiver Sean McDonald and the uh, Jason Kipnis, infielder, outfielder, 
Major League All-Star. Uh, we're going to be talking to both of them on their recent inductions or soon to be recent inductions into the ASU Hall of Fame. Dylan Tapley and Canyon Floyd, two important names on ASU's 2024 verbal commit list, both local recruits as well, in addition to being very talented football players in the own right. They're going to be joining the show a little bit later on to talk about why they are wanting to stay true and uh, become uh, hometown players for ASU. And then with baseball, kind of the, the dust has settled. Maybe the, the sting of ASU not getting into the postseason is subsided maybe a little bit. So we have, through that clarity, we're going to be joined by our friend Jack Loader, uh, no longer of DevilsDigest.com. He is now secu- he's back home in the Bay Area with some exciting career news that we will talk about. Uh, it's always great when uh, great things happen to great people. But uh, Jack is going to bring us some great insight and expertise into what is going on with the baseball program, what went wrong, what went right, and what is to come in the years ahead under Willie Bloomquist. But Joe, as is tradition, unlike any other, news always breaks on the day that we record. Today is, of course, no different. Earlier this afternoon, ASU made a major move on the recruiting trail, but not for the 2024 class that we'll be talking about uh, several new names as well. But a year ahead to 2025, ASU has landed their quarterback, and it's a good one. Four-star quarterback Michael Butter Tollefson, one of the better nicknames that uh, I've uh, run across in recent years. A six-foot-one, 195-pounder from J. Sarah High School in California. A four-star prospect, the number one overall quarterback in the state of California. Uh, number 11 pro-style quarterback nationally and per rivals. The number 76 player, regardless of any position, overall in the country that rec- the, the action on the recruiting trail we've talked about a lot about the the new energy and the dynamic that this staff is bringing and it is really paying some dividends now a lot to unfold here first we're going to focus on the nickname i mean is it i assume it's something just as simple as like you know he's really smooth he's smooth like butter but i, I would really love for it to be something like this guy just puts like a pound a country crock on a baked potato or something like that like that would be cool to me <laughs> well our friends at devil's digest actually got to the bottom i won't i will I won't give the spoiler i'll push you guys over to devil's digest.com for the answer but it is uh unfortunately joe not uh, not anything like dietary related okay so we're not having a you know like uh what's his name from kentucky putting the mayonnaise in his uh oh God, in his coffee you know like something weird <laughs> like that i mean you know it could be like bulletproof coffee with the butter i did the whole keto thing a couple years ago yeah, I'm overthinking this one. But athletically, not talking about condiments that you'd put on like an English muffin or something like that. Uh, yeah, you get a top 100 caliber player in any position, that's a good thing. You get a top five at his specific position, that's a good thing. Like you mentioned, the top quarterback in the state of California, they tend to know how to play some ball out there. Uh, across the board, however you slice and dice this situation, it's a big pickup. Now, I know that there are a lot of fans maybe that fall under the like battered fan syndrome uh, category that are thinking like this is 2025 that's too far in the future this guy's never even going to set foot on campus he's going to decommit five times before even picks a true college i mean the asu fans the fatalist point of views no way you know yeah right so um but it's it's a big pickup and obviously you pair that uh with the the guys that are still going to be with the program theoretically at that time and you know Jaden rashada from this past class curious what they might do for 2024 i mean you might even be able to survive uh without a high school com- commit at quarterback it's just a different ball game than it was in the past where you know again you think 10 years ago i remember didn't todd graham i think he had like back-to-back recruiting classes without a quarterback yeah. something like that with the whole josh dobbs and tj millward we're bringing out some names here at that time that i mean that was like Code red catastrophe. It's like, oh my god, you don't you get you didn't get a quarterback in this class. Oh, you didn't do it twice. Like that's the end of the world. Now transfer portal, other things. It's not. You can be more selective. So uh, again, it's a big time pickup. Dude had some offers. We're talking like Georgia, Oregon, Tennessee, A and M, a lot of others in the in the current existence of the Pac-12. So this is a sought after quarterback um, that uh, again you've got to be really happy for because. You'd think that that 25 class is probably going to be the one where ASU can really lay some inroads. You know, the ones that are going to be seniors this year, they the, the premier players 
have been recru- recruited for a few years, so AC is kind of behind the eight ball in that regard. You think that they've got a really good shot to strike. And when you get a quarterback that is this is you know this these sort of rankings, we've seen it from the Manny Wilkins of the world, the Jaden Daniels of the world. When you get somebody like this, that's how you can get others on board. Yeah, getting the the first commit of a class as a quarterback is a good because there is that kind of maybe Pied Piper effect there where they can kind of you know rally the the other recruits and now that you have you i think one of the points that you hit on is is very uh important here is that the 25 class is when the asu coaching staff really thinks that they can like really flex their muscles because of course you know coming in uh in november late in november and december last year you know, they don't have the relationships you know in the role that uh, they need to for you know but it, you know we've talked about how They've done pretty well. They put together some pretty quality classes in short order to, to finish out 23. And, of course, you know, guys like Jaden Rashada getting the, uh, a commit of that caliber on campus, a number of four stars. They have a couple of four stars already uh, rec- committed in the 2024 class. But when you're – the 2025, and that is something I, I recently talked to Jason Mons about uh, in the, getting specific into recruiting – he really thinks that the relationships and, you know, it, it, the recruiting all comes down to relationships. And whether it's, you know, guys out of high school or the portal, it's all comes down to relationships. And there's, there's no fast forward button there. And so getting a guy like this, you know, it, at, to start off that 2025 class when it's kind of like a, a referendum class, maybe, or just kind of a, 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 a proof in the pudding type situation with the 2025s. You'd love to see somebody getting a, a, you know this caliber of quarterback. This is a guy who, you know, while listed as a pro style, good athlete as well. You know, he's a four six five laser time forty. Although his dad in the story in Devil's Digest, you know, claims that he, his son can run a four five five. And so when you have that kind of arm strength uh, and, and accuracy and production at the high school level, along with that athleticism, we've seen what Kenny Dillingham can do. And I think this is further validation that quarterbacks want to play for Kenny Dillingham. And his track record, I mean, he turned Bo Picks into Bo Nix, Heisman contender. And his track record throughout his young coaching career is pretty prolific in terms of what he can do with his offensive scheme and as a developer of quarterbacks and as well as offensive coordinator Bo Baldwin and his track record with his offenses, especially as a head man at Eastern Washington and now as ASU's OC. Uh, you have Trent Borgay, Drew Pine in the fold as well. Of course, Jaden Rashada added. So you got some guys with some multiple years of uh, eligibility left. So perhaps ASU doesn't have to feel the need for 2024. But you know, as, as you mentioned, it's always good to you know kind of you know, always add a add an arm there. But you know, when you have some tent pole type quarterbacks of a Jaden Rashada uh, in 23, uh, 2025, and, and Tollefson coming in uh, you know, on the docket, you got to feel pretty good. And I think this is further validation of just. This staff just gets it, and like they've seven months into their tenure so far, and the energy and the, the the feel and the vibe around this program is so night and day compared to what it was when ASU is walking off the field after losing to U of A. Uh, it, it just you gotta love the, the what they've been doing, the direction of the program, and getting recruiting revitalized with the, the, the dynamic recruiters on that staff. Now, ultimately, it's going to come down to wins and losses. So we'll see. You know what happens this fall and in the, in the falls ahead, but right now, what this staff is doing on the recruiting trail and the transfer portal, man, you got to feel pretty good about the the momentum and the direction that things are going. Yeah, and you talk about Kenny Dillingham being a QB whisperer of sorts. I mean, that's shown in a variety of ways. Of course, Jane Rashada coming to ASU is a big part of that. He's not just coming to ASU because that's where his dad played. I mean, that's a connection with Kenny Dillingham. And think about. Uh, you know Dante Moore, that five-star quarterback that was all ready to go to Oregon. He's at UCLA right now, and it's my understanding that the reason that he didn't go to Oregon and is a Bruin is because Kenny Dillingham left Oregon to come to Arizona State. So you know he that is a position that he has a ton of influence over, a lot of credibility within the recruiting sphere of things. Uh, so I mean this is. Keep your fingers crossed, but this could become the new normal as far as, you know, having high caliber quarterbacks on deck ready to play for KD. Yeah, if you're able to, to land those blue chippers at the game's most important position, a lot of other guys that uh, help influence the wins and losses will, uh, will we've seen over and over again programs across the country, you know, that this can have a domino effect. That if you can start building, getting the consistent line of quality quarterbacks and 
you know, a lot of guys want to come play for him. So we'll see. You know, obviously 2025 is a ways away. And as you mentioned, the, I've already seen a lot of tweets and some message board posts about just, you know, the, oh, it's great now. And, you know, we'll see what, what happens, you know, come December uh, of that year. But, you know, this is a, I think, a major recruiting win right now uh, to get an, it's a great start to a very important class for this staff. And, uh, you know, we'll see how things transpire. But that's not the only good recruiting news ASU has had recently and perhaps more pressing in terms of the 2024 class that uh, is coming up that ASU is putting together. Uh, ASU, since we last joined you, has dropped or added five more verbal commitments. They've had a couple of uh, visit weekends, and in each of those weekends have come away with multiple commitments. So quick rundown of those guys. Uh, a couple weekends ago, wide receiver Colin Charles, a three-star prospect from Louisiana, five foot 11, 188 pounds. A defensive lineman Mason Fleming, a three-star from Texas, uh, of course, you know ASU's uh, Texas vibes are still going pretty strong. Six foot two, two hundred fifty eight pounder. He committed as well. And then a local prospect, a little bit under the radar, but I know a lot of folks that are plugged in to the local prep scene that think that ASU really kind of got a diamond in the rough here. Uh, this and the, the staff is really kind of, was kind of aggressive, kind of seeing that the frame that defensive end James Giggy had. He's right now a two star prospect per rivals. Six foot four, two hundred forty five pounder from Bradshaw Mountain. And that name still gives me chills because that when I was playing at Moon Valley, uh, we played up a, a game up in Bradshaw Mountain where our coach forbid us from wearing long sleeve shirts. So we were uh, all just very frozen as Valley uh, kids. Uh, they came out, they were all wearing long sleeves, and they kicked our ass. But, you know, so good for Bradshaw Mountain. But, yeah, James Giggy rounded out that first batch of, uh, of three commits with wide receiver Colin Charles, uh, defensive lineman Mason Fleming, and James Giggy. So good crop of, of uh, kind of potential athletes there. Yeah, and, uh, you know, they all kind of fall under that same general category of, you know, below-the-radar types, uh, especially Giggy. You know, the others have some maybe group of five offers, things like that, um, pretty much across the board. Uh, Giggy's an interesting one uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, also, from, like, the trivia perspective, it's trying to figure out, you know, how it's pretty infrequent that ASU has a – signing class members we're not necessarily just talking about people on the team but like a signing class scholarship caliber guy from the 928 the only ones i can really think of are james brooks who's from flagstaff chance cox is from you know pine top lakeside area prescott is in the 928 like that's (laughs) not many people could like i put that on the the message board devil's digest and not many people could really add on to that i mean yeah i'm sure they're that's why i limit it to like the 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 letter of intent guys because walk-ons things like that that's a little bit more common so um, even though it's not terribly far away it, it not necessarily a, you know breeding ground for elite football but uh, as you mentioned ASU could be getting in when the getting's good and these are the stories that uh, you love to see materialize if they can you know somebody that's under the radar someone that's a local guy even if it's not a true immediate hometown guy it's a good thing and this past weekend's group of visits resulted in two more commitments, bringing ASU's total to 11. Uh, offensive lineman Champ Westbrooks, I mean, that's a hell of a name right there. Add another star, Rivals, just because of the name. Uh, right now he's a three-star prospect, six foot five, 260-pounder uh, from the Los Angeles area. And then locally, defensive end Ramar Williams, three-star prospect, six foot three, 255-pounder from Mesa. So ASU continuing to... Add some guys that uh, on to both sides, or to both sides of the, uh, the lines there, and getting some guys in the trenches that they can uh, you know keep around and, de- and develop over the next couple of years. And West Brooks had uh, a few G5 offers: uh, Colorado State, Louisville, Nevada, UNLV, um, from the Department of Absolutely Pointless Commentary. I wonder if his last name is going to be like the next Andrew Walter Walters, Michael Eubank Eubanks, because <laughs> West Brooks. Not particularly common. Yeah. Westbrook, very <laughs> common. Like, how many folks are going to say Champ Westbrook? I would say it's relatively common. Um, Ramar Williams had a Jamar Williams 20 years ago. That's true. Now you got a Ramar Williams. If Ramar Williams plays anything like Jamar Williams, I'll be pretty happy about it. Another one under the radar. I know that East Mark School, like, they did some. Some big things, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, as far as did they win the state championship or something along those lines. I mean, a yeah, big program. I'm, you know, with obviously a lot of the 
uh, insight that that I and I'm sure Brad uh, obtain about these under the radar local players are you know from our guys that are doing stuff Arizona varsity whether it's Chili or Cody or those guys that are really you know cranking up the knowledge because these are the ones where that insight is is super valuable because these aren't the ones that are getting the national headlines but again these are D1 caliber players it's not like these coaches are just handing out scholarships to guys simply because they live in the Phoenix area so uh, yeah it'll be really unique to see how these particular players develop uh, and if ASU getting in when they did is going to prove to be you know a gold mine on players that can play at this level so with those commitments as mentioned earlier there are now 11 public verbal commits for ASU for this 2024 class per rivals that is uh, put good enough to put ASU 35th in the country a couple of uh, four-star prospects per rivals among that group a guy you'll hear from here momentarily and Dylan Tapley uh, the athlete out of Scottsdale and then Tony Lewis in, in Cuba the DB from Texas uh, as well and then a lot of you know a lot of three-star guys but of course you know there's still a season to play so those ratings can uh, change but one thing that the staff has done is kind of identified their type of guys and you know whether it is kind of a, a they see something in that diamond of the rough in, in like a, a giggy uh, or or mar williams a guy that you know perhaps is not playing against the highest level of competition like perhaps some of these guys coming from you know texas or locally here in you know scottsdale but they just feel pretty good about what they see and you know we know that this is a staff that's not necessarily having to take just bodies to fill out a roster no i mean because thankfully the ncaa rule uh, allowed them to obviously have that huge influx of newcomers, uh, both through the signing class and the transfer portal this past year. So you, you got to trust the process here a little bit. So we'll see what ASU is able to do. Uh, it is only you know mid late June, so a lot of a uh, lot of months and weeks ahead uh, until the early signing period opens up in December. But as of right now, you know the, the the momentum and energy from where we were a year ago is just continuing to be. Uh, real night and day. Yeah, that much is uh, very remarkable. I have to go back and look to get the actual numbers, but just my heart is telling me that, you know, this time in the summer, a year or two years ago, you know, you probably could count on one hand how many commitments ASU had, uh, given all the circumstances. So it'll be interesting to see how things pan out, just uh, philosophically in the sense of this is going to be the first, like, obviously the whole transfer portal has been around for a couple of years, but ASU pretty hamstrung by – previous coaching staff and concerns about allegations, et cetera, which of course impacted recruiting, even if there wasn't any real tangible impact on the recruiting. So with this, we're going to see how they move the chess pieces on, okay, how many high school guys you're going to bring in, how many transfers you're going to bring in, how are you going to focus on that? Are you using a lot of your high school recruiting on, um, you know, either guys that might be developmental players, but also some top tier ones. Again, just the, the, philosophy of the staff as it unfolds will be an interesting thing to keep an eye on all right so let's uh, talk to some of the the players that are going to be joined by these newcomers in this 2024 class guys who had previously committed and we, you know, we had talked about and broken down a little bit on prior episodes starting off with the uh, four-star member an athlete out of uh, scottsdale arizona dylan tapley all right so dylan let's start off with a big question what sold you on arizona state as being the right place for you I'd say the main thing that sold me was the constant love, love I felt from the coaching staff, uh, kind of, you know, making me feel like a priority. And then at the same time, how close it was to uh, home was also something that's really cool, you know, having it be only 20 or so minutes away, uh, knowing I can always come home and be with my family. And then then again, just uh, all around the coaching staff that um, is changing the culture and just building it around the right people and players is, um, something that means a lot to me. Now, Kane Dillingham, of course, has really kind of injected a lot of energy and enthusiasm into this program. Of course, a Sun Devil alum in his own right. What has really stood out to you in getting to know uh, Coach Dillingham as a, as a coach, as a program leader, and as a guy who just kind of wants to re-energize and re- reinvigorate the Valley? Yeah, I think you uh, just described perfectly the energy uh, he has unmatched. Uh, you know, just from being at a few spring practices in the spring game, you can see – the energy he has is like no other head coach in the country. He's always making things fun, but at the same time, they're working um, so hard at their goals. And I think that's something you definitely want to see from a head coach is uh, engaging with their players and uh, making everything as fun as possible and always having higher energy. So um, getting to know him over the past year or so has been great. And um, just the relationship that uh, he has with me is 
um, a huge factor in why I chose to go play for him. You uh, took a recent visit to ASU and got to hang around the campus, get to you know, some other co- uh, players and recruits that were on that visit. What, what were some of the things that kind of really kind of jumped out to you most about uh, your time within the program on that visit? The thing I, that uh, stood out to me the most that I liked was just like the connection the players all have to each other. They treat each other like a family. They're always hanging out together. Um, as soon as you step in the building, they're uh, greeting you and uh, treating you right and just making sure – that you know it feels like home and they make you like a family so that's that's the thing i liked about the most that's something that i really want uh in a school and also just you know the things we did on our visit going to dinner and just hanging around with the players it just made me confirm that this is the right spot to be and it really just felt like home ever since i got there you're one of the top local players uh, in the state of Arizona, and obviously you get to know you know there's some uh, quality teammates uh, on your roster right now, but also just getting to know kind of just the the feel across the, you know the the local high school football scene. What's your read on kind of the perception of ASU uh, under Kenny Dillingham in this kind of new era of Sunday football among those you know kind of top level local recruits? Yeah, everyone everyone kind of knows that uh, Sunday football is on the come up, and that we're in the process of rebuilding right now, but I think they're all they all trust this new coaching staff are all uh, great coaches and great dudes. So um, I think in the next couple of years will be, uh, you know, top of the Pac-12 and, you know, goal is to compete for obviously Pac-12 championships and Rose Bowls. And uh, they know what it takes to get to that level. And that's why they've been doing such a good job with recruiting and, you know, getting the right players from the transfer portal. And, uh, you know, just at their spring practices and summer practices, you can tell how, you know, hard they work out and, um, you know, that, they're, they're definitely on the come up. ASC's new staff has obviously put such a uh, renewed focus on, you know, kind of the the local talent here and kind of putting that proverbial fence around the state and, you know, the re- refocus on building those relationships here in the Valley. What impact, you know, did that have on you, seeing that the, the hard work, kind of the actions behind the words that this staff is putting in to make, you know, Arizona and, and the Valley such a priority? Yeah, it's been uh, very meaningful to me, my teammates, and you know the rest of the recruits around the valley because that's not th- something we had at the the last staff. Um, I mean, no disrespect to them, but this new staff obviously has emphasized um, recruiting the state very well, and you know they obviously know what it takes to get the top players from the state because they're 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 all from here. You know, Coach Dillingham, Coach Riggle, um, Coach Mons, um, the list goes on. They've all coached in Arizona High School. They know. Um, where the top players are at and you know putting putting priority on the Arizona high school recruits making them feel like home definitely plays a big role in my decision that's one of the main reasons I I uh, committed so early just you know the priority they, they put me out since I was an in-state player and you know just my talent they they really respected that for me in in recent prior years ASU's kind of struggled to keep some of the elite local talent here, but, you know, there's have been guys like DJ Foster, Nikhil Harry, Chase Lucas, some local guys who stayed true and uh, really have uh, made a huge impression uh, during their time as Sun Devils. How much appeal does, you know, being that, you know, potential quote unquote hometown hero have for you? Yeah, it, it definitely means a lot. You know, it's one of my dreams to be recognized with people like them, like DJ Foster, uh, Christian Kirk, Terrell Suggs. Um, so obviously, you know, that was, that's a big goal of mine for the future, but um, obviously, there's a lot of other factors that go into, you know, being that so-called hometown hero after uh, you're even done playing football. Like take DJ Foster, for example. He's um, currently not on the NFL team, but, you know, he's already on the ASU staff as a director of player player development. So um, going to ASU and, you know, being an alumni definitely sets, sets you up with great um, career opportunities for the rest of your life. So that's something that I also really look forward to because obviously can't play football forever. So I know that I'll have a uh, good – opportunities in my career after I'm, I'm done I'm done playing football looks like you're act- active on social media to kind of rally some other recruits and some some teammates and such to join you in Tempe is that something that you're you're putting you're putting more of an effort on to just kind of you know being that leader and trying to rally people around you to join you in this recruiting class yeah no doubt you know obviously two of my uh best friends Dylan Hip and Santana Wilson um obviously took the official visit with me last weekend um two teammates of mine that I've been playing with for years now I'm really putting an emphasis on uh, kids in the Valley to stay home with me because, uh, you know, we could be top of the top of the West Coast if we just – if we all stay home because, you know, Arizona high school football is uh, one of the top states, in my opinion, for high school football. So I think if we all just, 
you know, stay home together and play on the same team, that we, we'd uh, definitely be one of the best teams in the country. So I've been recruiting a lot of kids around the Valley in Arizona to try and stay home. So that's ultimately my goal, goal just to get kids to play with me too. You know, very, you're a very versatile player, a four-star athlete, a guy who has had great success on both sides of the ball. So you know, any of our listeners out there who might not have seen you in action, can you give a uh, kind of two scouting reports, you know, what you bring to the field on the offensive side of the ball and your skill set and what you bring on the defensive side? Yeah, I'll start with the offensive side of the ball. Obviously, you know, a bigger receiver, 6'4", 6'5", I weigh about like, you know, 205. So um, definitely not going to beat you with that breakaway speed, but – uh, I, I would like to say that I'm faster than uh, most people think, but I'd say my, um, you know, strength on offense is uh, con- contested catches and jump balls, which I prioritize that. Uh, you know, check the check my highlights. You'll see a lot of um, contested catches in traffic. And then on defense, you know, bigger safety, uh, a lot of interceptions last year. I think I uh, broke the school record. So um, those are just some things I break to the table. And then obviously defense too, I can come down in the box and, you know, make tackles in the run game. So those are two things I'll definitely bring to the table uh, when I get to college. You know, obviously not going to play both sides, but, you know, whatever side I end up on is uh, that's what I'm going to bring to the table. It sounded like at the time of your commitment that the staff's kind of open to letting you choose your path as to uh, where which side of the ball you land on. Are you leaning one way or the other? Do you have a preference as to where you uh, which side of the ball you like more? Uh, no, not right now. You know, don't have a preference right now. I just want to you know, get on the field and help the team as much as possible um, to win games. So I, I haven't really thought about it yet, you know, but either side I'm very happy at. And, you know, that's something that uh, the coaches and I will decide, you know, down the road. What's more satisfying for you, making a, like a big jump ball ca- uh, contested catch on offense or just like ma- coming back or coming down and like laying the, the lumber and just a huge hit on a, on a dude on defense? Oh, that's a tough one. I, <laughs> I got to say – uh, it's two different types of feelings, you know, contested catch on offense, you know, um, kind of sets the tone for the offense and gets us going a bit, especially with the touchdown, um, gets the crowd, crowd more, you know, hyped but on defense uh, at the same time. That also sets the tone for the game, you know, coming down and um, laying the lumber definitely uh, energizes the defense more to do the same thing. So it's two feelings that are very different from each other, but uh, two great feelings that, you know, uh, it's the beauty of playing both sides. You've been making a lot of those plays on both sides of the ball throughout your career, and you got one more season to go. When you look ahead to this final season of high school ball, what are some of your, the goals that you've set forth for yourself? Yeah, I think the first goal is pretty obvious. It's a state championship. Um, that's something that I've always wanted to accomplish at the high school level, and I think this year is uh, our best chance to do with the, the talent we have on offense and defense with our coaching staff. But for me, I'd say on offense, it's 20 touchdowns. Last year, uh, I was two touchdowns short of that. And then on defense, it's uh, to break the Arizona a high school record of interceptions in a career. Right now, I'm at 16, I think. I don't know what the record is, but if I'm at 16, I think I, I got to be close for that. So those are two records that I definitely um, want to accomplish. And then maybe just be like a Gatorade Player of the Year nominee or a Doherty Award nominee, which I was last year. So uh, those are two really good goals of mine. And then... Uh, on offense, maybe 1,500 receiving yards, too, and then defense, uh, 50 or so tackles again, which I think I had last season. So those are just the personal goals, but the ultimate goal is just to help my team win um, a state championship and, you know, help my teammates out as much as I can. So fast forward a year from now, you'll be, you know, approaching the summer workouts and getting ready for your first fall camp as a Sun Devil. You know, so, you know, over that time, over this, this next year, what are some of the things that you're doing or you'd like to do to, to prepare yourself to get ready for making that jump up to Pac-12 football? Yeah, I think the best thing I can do is just uh, to continue what I'm doing, you know, stay hungry, stay in the weight room, um, keep doing what I'm doing out in the field and really just uh, – get as much as much strength in the weight room as possible um so then i'm fully prepared for you know uh hitting people in college and you know even taking hits. so because uh, obviously the college speed and physicality is different so i'd say the main thing is just work on my speed and work on my strength and then you know just prepare mentally because it's gonna be uh, very mentally challenging but that's something that i'm ready for and now we'll hear from punter canyon floyd all right canyon so obviously kind of the big starting off with the big question what sold you on Arizona State and this program under Kenny Dillingham being the right place to continue your career? Um, I think it's mainly the special teams coordinator, Charlie Regal. He's He really knows what he's talking about. He makes it seem like 
it's a great place for me to go, and he really wants me to be there, and he has a plan for me to do the best I can and hopefully make it to the NFL one day. What things about Coach Regal that, you know, specifically his track record of development, you know, what kind of, you know, specific things about him and what he's been able to do over the course of his college uh, coaching career that really kind of, you know, convinced you that, you know, he was going to be the right guy to, to get you to where you want to go? Well, he's, first of all, he's really passionate about the game and he gets fired up a lot. And he knows what he's talking about with, like, kicking and punting. He's been doing it for a long time and he did a really good job at Cal. And he just overall knows what he's doing and he's going to be a really good coach. How how initially did you did you get into the sport of football and specifically you know into to becoming a, a specialist with you know being a, a kicker and punter? Uh, so I played soccer my whole life and in middle school I played flag football and I wanted to be on the football team in high school. So my dad said that I should try kicking and at first I started off with like kicking and and then I got into punting and they kind of just went from there and practiced a lot and got better. Do you uh, have uh, a favorite between the two of, uh, you know, place kicking or punting? Yeah, I definitely like punting a lot more. What is it about punting that uh, really kind of stands out to you above, uh, of those two? Well, I'm just better at it, so it's <laughs> less frustrating. Uh, obviously, you know, you're one of, the, one of several um, Sun Devil specialists, both uh, future and present, that have really kind of uh, uh, been studying under Roush kicking and, and you know, getting, uh, honing your craft there. You know, what, what kind of impact has Roush had on you and your development? He's he's been the best part of it. He's been a really good coach, and he's he's really good on the recruiting, and he's helped me get like a lot of interest in communication with coaches, and he really helped my punting get a lot better. What are some of the things that uh, you've taken away from him in terms of just kind of the 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 art of punting, the technical aspects of the of the craft? Um, he just has me working on my drops a lot because that's the most important thing. Just keep doing your drop over and over and over, and then just. Hitting the ball good. It's just it's just practice. You got to keep practice a lot. And I've been with him for about a year now, so it's really helped me. Yeah, Arizona State under Coach Dillingham has really kind of placed a renewed focus on the hometown recruits and the Arizona high school talent. What kind of what kind of impact? What is it? What kind of jumped out to you about this new staff's uh, you know, focus and rededication to keeping the best local talent here in the state? I, I really like that they're doing that. I think that they should recruit a lot of Arizona kids and I like coach doing him. He's really young and he, he really knows what he's doing. It would, you know, coach doing of course, one of the younger guys, I believe the youngest in, in the power five, just 32 years old, 33 years old. You know, what, what is it like, you know, having a, a future coach is kind of, you know, being on the younger side of things, perhaps do you find that to, to be more relatable or, or a more, a more attractive option when you were looking at, you know, where to play your college ball? Um, I don't, I don't really think his age had anything to do with that. I think, it's what he knows about football. I don't think his age matters as much. He might have like a little less experience, but he's a good coach and he definitely knows what he's doing. You know, a lot of fans in the stands might just kind of take you know the, a punt for granted of just you know kicking the ball far and you know getting some hang time. But you know, obviously, it's a very technical, uh, you know, a very difficult job on the football field. A very important job. You know, what are some of the, the you think the finer points of punting that uh, you know that perhaps the average fan on the stand might take for granted? Um, well, first of all, is you gotta most of the time you gotta aim it a certain direction and put it to where your gunners or whoever's running downfield have them there. So you have to put it in like a pretty small window of where they want it to be, and it's a lot harder to directionally aim it as people would think. And I mean, it's hard to be consistent at punting, so I feel like people just take that for granted. They're like, "Oh, he's just kicking the ball, like that's great," but it's a lot harder than people think. Last season, uh, I believe you had over a, a 50 yard uh, per kick average, an 80 yard boot last season. Was that was that the, the longest kick you've ever had in a game? Yeah, I think so. That, that was a good one. <laughs> uh, you know, what are some of the, the ways that you kind of you know are able to kind of develop that range, and uh, also just you know obviously you not necessarily just want to blast the ball as far as you can every time. As you mentioned, you know, just kind of coordination with kind of the, the coverage there, but also getting the hang time there. Uh, what is it like just kind of honing the craft of all those developments of having a strong leg, but also an accurate leg? Yeah, well, I got lucky. I have like, I've been told I have a really like quick leg. So I hit the ball a lot faster than most people. And that brings a lot of power and just like the direction that's just practice. You got to keep practicing aiming. You got to like realize how the ball flies in the air and, you got to get the ball to turn over a lot. And it's, it's honestly just you got to keep practicing to get better direction. But I got lucky with the fast leg. 
you know, obviously you're excelling on the field, but also in the classroom as well. I believe a 4.71 GPA. Uh, how does that even possible? You know, getting, you know, I thought, you know, four was perfect, but now you're getting, you know, you're pushing five. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just honors classes because they count <laughs> as five and I wish I could, it could be a little higher, but it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so obviously you got one more season of uh, high school ball left. You know, what are some of the goals that you've set for forth for yourself for that final year? Well, first of all, I think it's to keep above a 50 average on home, which is going to be hard because I got, I got lucky last year. They're, like, that's really hard to do. I'm, I got some good roles. Some other goals are have my direction, keep working, keep getting that better because that's going to matter a lot more in college than it is in high school. And for kicking, it's I'm probably my goal is probably not to miss it all on field goals and kickoffs is to get a high touchback percentage. And about a year uh, from now, you're going to be uh, prepping for – first fall camp as a Sun Devil. What's it going to mean to you to, you know, to get to put on that maroon and gold and, and rep your hometown university? Yeah, it's going to be really cool. It's definitely something you want to do as someone that lives in Arizona, like everyone likes the Sun Devils. Yeah, it's going to be really cool to wear their jersey and play with them. And then obviously, you know, uh, before that time happens, you know, a lot of time, you know, for your upcoming senior season here, but then the, the couple months before you can roll and get on campus, what are the things that you're going to be focusing and dialing and making sure that you're getting ready and that uh, for the next level and making that jump to power five football? Um, first thing I'm going to work on is I got to like, I got to get my catch to kick time down because guys in college are going to be a lot faster than they are in high school, a lot bigger, a lot stronger. I just want to focus on getting it off and not getting blocked or hit or anything like that. So it's definitely speed. ASU also made a pretty important addition through the transfer portal for this 2023 season up ahead. Uh, you know, we talked about in recent episodes about how the need for more quality depth on the defensive line and at linebacker uh, is pretty paramount for the Sun Devil defense. And while they got some bad news in terms of Corey Roberson, the uh, defensive tackle coming from Oklahoma decommitting pretty quick and heading off to SMU. ASU did get some long-awaited good news that it was able to be made official. The linebacker Juwan Mitchell was going to be joining the Sun Devils. So he's coming over uh, from Tennessee. Now he's a six foot one, two hundred thirty-five pounder who started off with uh, going the junior college route, then played a little bit at Texas. Twenty twenty made eight starts with sixty-two tackles, four and a half for loss. And then in 2021, red-shirted after injury, uh, moved over to the Vols a year ago, uh, made seven starts for him, posted 43 tackles, ha- uh, half tackle for loss, three quarterback hurries, and a couple passes defended. But uh, he has one year left uh, to go. But, you know, having an experienced guy, a guy who's played football at a high level and had some success there, to a group, that uh, linebacking group for the Sun Devils, that some good talent and but in potential but just guys who haven't really been able to f- put it on display and and to a level that you think you're fully confident of course will schaefer is a guy that has uh, been around the program for a number of years and his body transformation has been nothing short of, of uh, uh, amazing uh he's looked really good in spring of course travion brown coming over from washington state is kind of the elder statesman but he's never been anything uh, to a, a full-time starter throughout his uh career to this point but those are probably your one and two options uh, at, the, at the starting positions, but a guy like Jawan Mitchell, who started at the, the Power 5 level, uh, can only help add some quality depth, if not make a run at one of those starting jobs. Yeah, I mean, this is a good pickup. As you mentioned, 2020, uh, he led Texas in in tackles during that uh, COVID season, and it wasn't a horribly shortened season. There were 10 games that he played uh, for them, a little different than the four that ASU played that year. And then uh, productive at it with, the, obviously, a very good Tennessee team last year. So this guy's played some major, major college football. So this is a, this is an important get, one that, as you mentioned, had been uh, not really rumored about. I mean, it was basically going to happen. Just had to stay under wraps for a bit. He and Roberson were supposed to be, you know, both coming in at the essentially the same time, and it was kind of shaking out that way. But obviously uh, only one uh, is seeming to make his way to Tempe, uh, as it all shakes out uh, but that's a position group as we have talked about when we're identifying the needs from you know post spring ball pre-fall camp linebackers right up there in one of the top two or three most important positions where ASU needs to add some talent and some depth and so yeah so he's kind of an, in a similar light as you mentioned to the likes of Brown and Schaefer where you know, they've got playing experience. They've got some starting experience, maybe not like full-time starters. I would have to say, just with this is just a guess, but Mitchell probably has as much starting experience as anybody in the position group now for ASU, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, I'd imagine he 
is there to make a run at possibly starting and at a minimum, you know, pushing those others uh, to do so as well. Of course, with ASU's new defense, not going to have quite as many linebackers out there as you would in other circumstances. But uh, once again, this is a what I believe to be a very good pickup at a position of need. It's a one-year player, but it's it's checks all the boxes that you need at this time. Yeah, and so obviously you have like Schaefer and uh, and Brown is probably your your uh, guys are going to be entering the uh, entering fall camp atop the jet depth chart as well. But you know, James Jonkin had I thought a really good uh, productive spring. He seems to be revitalized in this new Sun Devil defense as well. And some younger guys coming in that uh, you know transferred in that uh, started their careers elsewhere and Crew Jackson, uh, Tate Romney, Caleb McCall is a guy who's made some plays and been around the program for a number of years. Uh, but you ne- don't necessarily want to ne- have to throw a guy like Kavion Thunderbird, uh, you know, true freshman in there, if you are ha- or have the ability to bring in a, a guy with some Power 5 experience, and that's what they did there. And so kind of revisiting Kenny Dillingham's wish list post-spring ball uh, and see what ASU has done. You know, he mentioned that they needed some help on the offensive line, interior defensive line, a linebacker, and then one or two wild cards. And as we talked about, wide receiver Jordan Tyson and D- cornerback D. Ford. Kind of fill those wild cards. Mitchell helps that linebacker, and they made a couple of additions uh, in on the offensive line. And but just the defensive line for me is still you know, obviously with the you know losing Roberson in his brief you know a few days as a as a commit uh, you know really hurts. And so it's a lot of those guys on the defensive line gonna have to make some big steps forward. And of course the the, the ability for ASU to add a uh, player is not closed. But you know this that's a premium position that a lot of that every school. Always wants to be to bolster, and so getting somebody that can come in and impact right away, it's going to be going to be pretty tough, not impossible, but uh, you know, so far that you know ASU has, has taken care of some uh, some some important spots in post spring, but still, I think one area that is really uh, kind of kind of worrisome to me. Yeah, it's it's a tough position to be in where those glaring areas of need are some of the you know premium spots you know you've got guys if you're a offensive or defensive lineman in the transfer portal with you know solid starting experience or high upside you can almost punch your own ticket anywhere you'd like to go because a lot of teams even the most prestigious ones are going to be looking for opportunities there so you know it was a bit of a uh negative momentum slope for a hot minute there with roberson opting to go elsewhere and then that uh, jeffrey clark who ASU had a solid shot at and high school teammate of BJ Green. I believe what he chose Louisville, if I'm not mistaken. Um, So, you know, there were a couple names in a row that just didn't go ASU's way. So, yeah, the defensive lineman, uh, as you've said, going to need to step up, obviously, with the offensive line as well. And that those are two combined position groups where if you have some obvious weaknesses that can downgrade the ability of a team as a whole. So not necessarily going to get too ahead of myself with the worries in that regard, but uh, it would be certainly wonderful if there were some, you know, random transfers that just happen to need a home that have high caliber potential and ended up in the ASU's lap. So about this time of year, ASU always announces their intention to induct some of the greatest athletes in Sun Devil history into the school's Hall of Fame. And you're going to be hearing from a couple here in a moment. But, uh, you know, Joe, who are the full list of these 2023 honorees? Yeah, so this is a topic that, uh, you know, for me each year always catches my attention. It's something that, uh, again, when this time of the calendar year comes around, kind of enters my thought process just from the – the perspective of how much I value the history of Sun Devil Athletics and how it's just, you know, a, a ASU history nerd, uh, this this really appeals to me. And also, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with former ASU athletes, former ASU star athletes over the years. And the topic of the Hall of Fame means one heck of a lot to them. And that goes for the ones who I've had that conversation with who are in the Hall of Fame and especially those who are not and believe, and rightfully believe, that they have an argument to be in the Hall of Fame. So I I honestly don't know where this whole topic hits with, like, fans, if this is just something that they see, you know, in a tweet on a summer day, and like, oh, that's cool, and then never think about it again, and then they go to a football game later in the year, and everybody's honored. Uh, But I, I tell you, to the players, this means a lot. A lot. 
And that goes equally once again for those who are inducted and for those who hear the names of others called when they believe that theirs should be called. So that's kind of why this whole thing is, you know, it's, it's important to me. Uh, but this year's class, we'll give them a lot of kudos. The 2023 Hall of Fame class, uh, the Hall of Distinction inductee, Greg Kraft, former, uh, I believe, track and field head coach. I think the Hall of Distinction is where the coaches and other, I think it's some administrators and things like that go, if I'm not mistaken. Addison McGrath from water polo. Jordan Clark from the track and field team. Uh, Jason Kipnis from baseball. Regina Mannix from volleyball, the entire 2007 women's track and field team, and Sean McDonald, long overdue. Uh, that was one that, you know, very happy for everybody that was inducted. When I saw that Sean McDonald was uh, chosen among this class, that's something that uh, I really smiled about. Again, this is just a topic that just has always been interesting to me. A couple years ago, uh, pre-COVID, wrote something for Devil's Digest about the ones that I felt should be next in line. And uh, there have always been two names. When I say always, I mean for the last handful of years, there have been two names that top that list. And it's kind of a one in one a situation, but the, the one had been Sean McDonald because, I mean, he has every criteria that uh, that is needed you know for induction in asus hall of fame there are a few things they're looking for they're looking for all america honors they're looking for you know statistical achievements they're looking for maybe individual national championships for the individual sport competitors uh what you do after college has it has an impact on it uh sean mcdonald just had it all so uh and and he's someone who you know had been out of the nfl for a little over 10 years now i believe 2009 was his last season playing the only real time requirement, the, the the other two real requirements that ASU puts in place is that you have to be 10 years removed from your college career, and you can't be playing professional sports. So to put that into perspective, like that's why Terrell Suggs was inducted last year, because ASU did not do a 2020 or a 2021 class for the Hall of Fame due to COVID. Terrell Suggs retired after the 2019 season. That's why it took a while for him to be inducted. A guy like Sean McDonald been out of the league for a while. So, again, the questions around it, those don't need to be asked anymore. He's a Hall of Famer. Uh, so it's great to see for this class. Now, it also tips into the topic of the other deserving candidates and ones that give me personal question marks, Brad, about you know why, why they aren't in and the ones I think should be in. This might have to be an off-season episode because, yeah, there's uh, some notable names that do check a lot or check all those boxes that just aren't in. And I don't know. Like, I mean, it's kind of a thing. I, if you're – it's uh, – like with a, with a lot of the, the professional sports, Hall of Fames and such, especially like baseball, just like, it, it, the, you know, you guys that take a while to get in or be voted in. It's just like I, I think that – you're either a Hall of Famer or not. Like I don't know that it happens over time, and so there's a lot of deserving Sun Devil greats that uh, that should be uh, in, and I think that you know they're worthy of discussion and celebration, and hopefully soon induction. Yep. And I'll just run some names, and like you said, yeah, it is content for for a future show in greater depth. Um, Keith Poole, when I said I had a one and a one A for for football, and Sean McDonald's number one. Keith Poole is one A. I don't get it. I'm going to bang that drum every year until he's in. I don't understand why Keith Poole's not in ASU's Hall of Fame. He checks every box that he needs to. He was an All-American. He set school records. He played well in the NFL. He was part of one of the most memorable teams in school history. He was a key component of it. I don't get it. So that's why he's going to be number one until he's in. <laughs> um, and now you're starting to have guys. Now, there are also a few from the football side that have very substantial arguments, but then also have some reasons why some may hold them out. And there are two names that come to mind. And that's Terry Battle and Jeremy Stott. Those are guys that each had one absolutely dominant All-America year. Terry Battle did for 1996. Jeremy Stott did in 97. But the argument against it would be that they had that one great year. And then, you know, Jeremy Stott was a reserve in 1996. But, you know, he's someone that I think truly warrants consideration into the Hall of Fame, not only for what he did because he, he, he's, he met the requirements that, that they have, what he did beyond not only ASU but beyond football with military service and being active in that community. I think that warrants Hall of Fame induction. Similar with Terry Battle. Now you're going to have also guys that are from, dude, time's flying, that are from even like the Todd Graham era that now are eligible. Like a, like a Will Sutton I think was eligible this year. 
You're going to have Jalen Strong coming up on eligibility. You're going to have DJ Foster being eligible in a couple of years. So, you know, as these years come up, you're going to have some guys that are kind of like your quote-unquote first ballot type guys. So in the next few years, some familiar names could be inducted as, in there as well. Just skimming through some other sports, it's wild to me uh, looking through men's basketball. Mario Bennett, Ron Riley, they are not in ASU's Hall of Fame. Uh, that is shocking, and those guys weren't involved in the, you know, the – headache smith things that were going on uh baseball there's a list the top of the list that uh, that stand out to me brett wallace brett wallace i don't believe he's in asu's hall of fame and that is unbelievable ike davis is up there too as far as a name that that certainly merits uh consideration so again discussion for another time and i don't want to focus <laughs> on the ones that didn't get inducted and take away from the you know celebration of those who did but just always an interesting topic that I can clearly ramble on about for quite some time. But again, congratulations to this entire class, every single one of them. Special place in my heart for Sean McDonald and, and, and him finally getting in. Joining us now, one of the most prolific and dynamic wide receivers ever to play for ASU. He was as good of a deep ball threat as you'll ever see in a bona fide playmaker anytime he touched the ball, whether as a receiver or as a return man. He lit up the Pac-10 Conference during his days in Tempe as a two-time first-team all-conference honors recipient, capped off by a record-setting junior season in 2002 when he was a third-team All-American and a Boletnikoff Award finalist after catching 87 passes for 1,405 yards, both of which remain ASU single-season program records, along with 13 touchdown receptions that year. That season, he also became the first player in Arizona State history to record back-to-back 1,000-yard receiving seasons after he totaled 1,104 yards with 10 touchdown catches as a redshirt sophomore in 2001. He's a hometown hero who came to ASU from Phoenix's Shadow Mountain High School, and after ASU, he went on to play in the NFL from 2003 to 2009, logging 220 career receptions at the pro level. He has long been considered one of the absolute best players at his position in the history of ASU football, his career is one that won't be forgotten, and last week, he officially achieved true Sun Devil immortality by being named a member of ASU's 2023 Hall of Fame class. We welcome aboard ASU Hall of Famer, Sean McDonald. Thanks for coming aboard, my man. <laughs> thank you for having me, and thank you for that great intro. That was, that was great. We got to get you hyped up. You're a Hall of Famer, my friend, so... <laughs> So we're going to talk a lot yeah. about your ASU career, but first let's talk about that big news you received last week. If I'm not mistaken, this announcement was made public on your birthday, right? So tell us, how did you find out that you were a member of ASU's 2023 Hall of Fame class, and what were your reactions to getting that news? Uh, actually, I had a voicemail on my work email, or my work voice mess, voicemail from um, from Ray Anderson, so I was kind of wondering why he would be calling me on my on my work office and I gave him a call back and he gave me the news and I was ecstatic man it was it was great news and I'm just so honored to be mentioned with guys guys like J.R. Redmond who, who commented on my post and you know Terrell Suggs and guys like that so it's just it's, it's going to be a, a great 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 celebration I can't wait for the, for the season to come. So now let's take it all the way back to before you joined the Sun Devil football program in the late 90s, you're a star at Phoenix's Shadow Mountain High School. Your older brother, Tarek, was a receiver on the Sun Devil roster when you were making your college choice. Was it a simple slam dunk that you were going to become a Sun Devil, or were there other schools that got serious consideration when you were going through the recruitment process? I, th I think a few schools got some serious consideration, but I was I was a soccer player in high school, so really I, I didn't really start thinking about playing football until I was about a senior in high school. And to be honest... ASU was really going to be the only choice. You know, I wanted to stay home. I wanted to be a Sun Devil, and I wanted to play with my brother. So it was going to be Sun Devils. I didn't even take another trip, so it was going to be Sun Devils. So the, I, I committed pretty shortly after they, they uh, offered and couldn't wait to graduate and get, get on the field with some of those guys. So you mentioned that you that soccer was your main sport in high school up to the uh, senior season. Yeah, but at what point did you realize that you perhaps had the skills to you know play at the next level or even beyond? Uh, maybe uh, when I got an offer. So my first offer came my junior year from Nebraska, and that's the first time I ever even thought about playing college football. Um, and then I started, you know, kind of preparing for. It. I kind of started working out more, started lifting more weights and stuff, just just in case. Just 
you know, just because I didn't really know what I was going to end up doing after high school. Um, and I just kind of fell into that idea. I mean, back then, soccer, you didn't really have too many choices after, after college. It was kind of like college and, you know, do whatever. So football is a lot more options. You know, you got full ride scholarships and, you know, go to a school like an ASU or that. Those kind of schools offering you kind of those kind of full rides. It's, it's hard to kind of look the other way. So as a Valley kid, you're staying with the hometown university. So overall, what did it mean to for you to kind of ball out there for your for your hometown school? I mean, I love it. I think that's the best best thing to do to be to go to your local go to your local college and 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 produce and and, and be the reason that that you know the, the fans are filling up. So it was it was great, man. Y'all, I felt like I got way more fans just from being a local guy. So. I wouldn't trade it in for nothing. I would definitely do it over and over again. Now, during your time at ASU, of course, as a true freshman and redshirt freshman, you played for the late Bruce Snyder, then your final two seasons for Dirk Cutter. What sort of impact did those two coaches have on you, and how different was it from uh, playing for Cutter compared to Snyder? It was totally different. When I got in, it, I felt like we were a more older team. Snyder kind of treated us like we are an older team, and, I was an 18 year old kid and I wasn't, I wasn't ready to be treated like an older team. So I think, um, I had some rough, rough beginnings going in there. And I think when, uh, Cutter came around, he came in and he came in and kind of treated us like, like young adults rather than, you know, grown adults. So he kind of set some rules and that kind of, kind of got, definitely got me, uh, um, more aligned with doing the right things and making the right choices. And that, that, I think that kind of helped me propel to, uh, to just play better on the field because I was just better prepared off the field and everything. So I feel like that structure really helped me. And, of course, after probably getting on the field and having a, a good uh, season, you know, 300 yards receiving that first year when you're getting out there, make a big jump in that second year, contributing to the team over 1,100 yards, 10 scores. What factors kind of helped you make that big-time jump and to add to a uh, one of the Pac-12's best opportunity, opportunity, and just you know the, the different kind of playbooks. You know, Snyder was more about you know running the ball, controlling the game, and Cutter was more about if we're going to take a, if we're going to be throwing the ball, we're going to take some deep shots. So that fit me perfectly. So it was it was perfect timing for that change, and it was it was what I needed for my career, and I took the opportunity and ran with it. And, just luckily we had some quarterbacks that could put it up there and, and um, you know, we made the plays when they were there. Speaking of those quarterbacks, one of the most prolific to ever wear the moon and gold, Andrew Walter was a guy that uh, it was kind of formed that one of the most deadly one, two combos in school history. How fast did that kind of rapport between you and Andrew take to develop? Uh, it took a while, actually. I mean, I had, I think I've had, in my three years there, I think I had seven starting quarterbacks. So <laughs> I think Andrew, I, I might have had Andrew for maybe only 10 games of my career. So I didn't, I wish I would have, I wish we would have got that rapport a little faster. I think we would have put up even bigger numbers. So I, I think I got my last 10 games. I think he didn't, you know, he, he didn't start till about week four of my, my junior year. So I only got about 10 games with him, but he, I mean, I wish I would have got, you know, two seasons with him. I, that arm was was serious. Of course, in 2002, you put together what is still probably the best receiving season in school history. Records that still stand to this day. But on the other side of the ball, your teammate Terrell Suggs putting rewriting the NCAA record book in his own right and just sack after sack. What was it like just having that 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 kind of one two punch with you on the offensive side of the ball and Terrell on the defensive side of the ball? And that that same team just kind of putting up some incredible numbers that still stand the test, the test of time. Yeah, I, I'm, we were definitely excited. We definitely made some plays, and I mean, that was the, the, the things Terrell was doing was amazing. I mean, I I went to the NFL for seven years, and I didn't see anything compared to that. So, it, I mean, I, I don't think anyone will ever do anything close to what Terrell did that season. So, I'm just glad I was there, front row to witness what he what he what he did. So now, also on that 2002 team, you had a true freshman playing alongside you at wide receiver by the name of Derek Hagan, who went on some pretty good things at ASU, a Hall of Famer like yourself now. So as an experienced veteran on that team, how did you help D. Hague to adjust to the college game? And did you see things in him that season that made you believe he'd go on to have the career that he did? 
Yeah, for sure. He was a true freshman out there playing with us, and he was making plays. I, I mean, he had a lot of yards that year, and I think he started quite a few games as a true freshman. So he he definitely came in showing the talent he had, and with the with the playbook that that Cutter has, you knew he was going to put up big, put up some big numbers. So I, I wasn't surprised at all that that uh, D. Hay put up those numbers and. I mean, now we we always go back and forth on who, you know who was the best during that time. So now he can't he can't hold the Hall of Fame over me. So now <laughs> we can we can start that argument up again. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so now our listeners, of course, always love to hear stories about the Territorial Cup game, what it's like for the good guys to play against that team down south. If you include your redshirt season, you were a part of uh, Sun Devil teams that went three and one against Arizona. We also know that you've got uh, some family connections to a pretty prominent Wildcat. So what are the top memories you have from your games against the U of A? I mean, I guess the, probably the biggest memory is the, that time where we all got in the fight at the end of the game. I, I didn't – I was almost in the locker room, but I definitely witnessed it from far. But that was a memory I'll probably never forget. Just, I think actually, yeah, they came and beat us. on our, That was the, time, the only time I lost them, and they beat us at Arizona State. And some of our – some of our – some of my teammates didn't take kindly to how they were celebrating, so it ended up being a little meet, you know, a little brawl in, in the uh, center field, fifty yard line. So that's definitely a memory I, I don't think I'll ever forget. Yeah, I think I remember our good buddy uh, Kurt Wallen launching a Wildcat helmet into the student section, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I was I was a freshman at that time, watching from the stands. So yeah, I felt that one a little bit. So. Um, now, with that being the case, how, how sweet did it make going down to Tucson and getting that win? And, you know, what was one of your last college games that next year? Uh, I mean, I loved it. I loved preparing for the Wildcats every – every that, that last game of the year was always fun. You know, definitely having that connection with Mike being up there is always fun because we, we, we still have the, those talks about Sun Devils versus, versus Wildcats. And I still have guys I played in the NFL – that we still talk about. We still talk about placing bets on that game, and we still talk about games that, you know, that happened 20 years ago. We're still talking talking trash. So I, I love rivalries, and I'll, I'll always keep that up. But I'll, I'll always put, put kill the cats on my post when I'm talking about U of A, so I'm always going to be a U of A hater. Yeah, so uh-huh. for <laughs> I was going to say, for, for listeners who may not put the piece together, Mike Bibby's your cousin, correct? Yeah, yeah, so Mike Bibby's my cousin. So I got that connection. And then my, my sister actually ran track there for a few years as well. So I got a few connections down there. But it's still Sun Devils. It's always kill the cat. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, so as you look back at all of it, in addition to the things that you've told us, what are some of your favorite memories from your time at ASU? It can be on or off the field. And who are some of the people that had the greatest influence on you when you were playing your college ball? Uh, I mean, I've got so many great memories I could go from anything, from being on the field, from being off the field. I'm mean, I'm still in the fantasy league with uh, ten guys that I played with back then. So my memories are still still forming from from ASU. So I, I just love that time time of frame or that that three four years I, I spent up there. And I mean, I, there's so many guys that that influenced me while I was there, man. And I'm I want to give a shout out to RJ because he RJ Oliver, who I played up, up there with, he kept my name alive up in the up in the up in the uh football football building to tell him that you know i need to be in the hall of fame he kept you know kept kept you know kept edging him it's it's, it's my time so i want to give him a shout out for you know keeping me alive keep my name keep my name floating up there so i can get uh the recognition he thinks i deserve and of course you rewrite the sun level record books then go on to play in the nfl for a while but while you're you're playing on Sundays, you're also finding the time to finish up your degree. What did it mean to kind of you know go back and be able to to get that degree to to graduate from ASU all while in the middle of the of your NFL career? Oh, it was great. And I, I'll give another shout out to Skylar Fulton. He was a guy who told me you know got me to sign up, drove me up to campus. Was like let's just finish. So we went up there, and we signed up for classes, and I actually ended up winning the, an, an NFL award for uh going back i ended up getting a 4.0 in my last semester when i graduated and i ended up winning a continuing nfl or nfl continuing education awards so which was surprising but great you know i never thought i would win a 
you know, award for academics. So that was something that, that I still have in my kitchen. It's up, up in my mantle. So that, that's a, that was a great experience. All these years later, when you look back on it and you know, the impact that you that the son of a football program has had, just to the overall ASU community at, at large, what has just being a son of a meant to you on and off the field? It means a lot. I, I mean, I, my my house, I got a bunch of Sun Devils all over the place. My son is always throwing up the Sparky, you know, throwing up the pitchfork. So we're going to be a Sun Devil family for sure. My, I met my wife while I was while I was in school. You know, she's she's got her master's and her bachelor's from from ASU. So ASU means a lot, to, especially to my personal, my my uh, my immediate family. So it's it's everything to me. So it's. Now that being in the Hall of Fame is going to be something else that's going to go up on the wall, you know, about ASU. So I know my kids are going to grow up Sun Devils, and hopefully they end up going to Sun Devils and participating in whatever they do. So let's get your thoughts on kind of the current state of the program. 2023, of course, will be year one for ASU alum Kenny Dillingham as head coach of Sun Devil football. What are your thoughts on Dillingham so far? I'm excited. I went to a spring practice, and they look good. Uh, I, I love that they're throwing the ball around. I, Looking forward to that. I want to see one of those receivers try to get get that record. I want to get, want to see if they get close. I, I don't I don't know if I want them to break it, but they can get pretty close to it. I'll, I'll, that was Jarrell good. Robinson came pretty close a couple years ago. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and actually, I was talking with him the whole time he was doing it with uh, the whole time he was doing it. So it was that was really cool. So hopefully we get some other guys. I know they got a transfer coming in that he looks real good at practice. So maybe hopefully he gets pretty close to it. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what you've got going on in life right now. Uh, looks like in January of last year, you were named Major Gifts Officer of the Yavapai College Athletics Department. What sort of responsibilities uh, does that include, and how's that going for you? Uh, I'm loving it. So I, I fundraise for the athletic department. We uh, got a fundraise for some of our scholarships for our student athletes. So, you know, I go in there, I talk to businesses, I try to get corporate sponsorships, I try to, you know, get donors, I try to, uh, we throw events, so we got a golf event happening in September that we threw last year, we had, that we, it was sold out of then, we had uh, filled, filled up with golfers. Um, it's just, just trying to fundraise and trying to get, get money to get students uh, tuition in, in, in dorm, you know, up in, up in Prescott, Arizona, so I'm, I'm working at Yavapai College. So... You know, things have changed a little bit up there, so we're up there fundraising, trying to get these scholarships. So that's pretty much my only role. No, you have uh, your name all over the Sun Devil record book, all kinds of accolades on your resume. Uh, and the newest one, of course, ASU Hall of Famer. Overall, how do you hope ASU fans remember you? Uh, as a, like, like, yeah, as you came in, a big play receiver. I, I like to be like to be mentioned like that so you know i, I like uh so some of my my uh my son's friends some of their dads were big asu fans so it's fun meeting them and their some of their memories are the same you're saying big plays andrew walters throwing big big touchdowns at me so that i would love to be remembered like that so you know that's that's the goal and hopefully it keeps going that way well sean my friend we are very, very happy for you. Ask me, it's long overdue, but hey, that's all in the past because you are a Hall of Famer. Can't wait for you to have your moment, celebrate that during the football season. Very, very well earned. Like I said, and I'd say it not just because you're here, one of the absolute best wide receivers in the history of Sun Devil football. Very, very happy for you to have your rightful place in ASU's Hall of Fame, and we truly appreciate you taking some time for us here this evening. Thank you, thank you. And it was perfect timing. Now my son can come to the game and witness it all. So it was perfect timing. Everything happens for a reason. So October 7th, I can't wait to see everybody and let's celebrate. Joining us now to talk about his recent induction into ASU's Hall of Fame. This guy did the transfer thing before transferring was cool. He started his baseball career at the University of Kentucky and then made the incredible decision to transfer to Arizona State University to play for head coach Pat Murphy for Sun Devil Baseball. In 2008, his first season in maroon and gold, he was the Pac-10 Conference Newcomer of the Year. Things got even better the next season when he was the Pac-10 Conference Player of the Year, a first-team All-American in 2009, helping guide ASU to a deep run in the College World Series. When he went on to the pro level, man, he was a fan favorite all the way, spent the better part of a decade in the big leagues, mainly with the 
Cleveland Indians at the time and his final season with the Chicago Cubs. He was a two-time All-Star, a gritty performer, uh, lovingly nicknamed Dirtbag, just the kind of player you want to have on every single team, no matter what sport it is. This year, earlier this year, he retired from professional baseball, and now he will be a member of ASU's Sports Hall of Fame. Of course, he is the one and the only Sun Devil baseball alum, Jason Kipnis. All right, Jason, congrats, first off, congratulations on being a member of ASU's 2023 Hall of Fame class. How did you get the news, and what was your initial reaction? The initial reaction was a little shock, um, just because I, I, I've only I went there for two years, um, and, and at first I was like, is this just like a baseball thing? Because I know the pride and the history of the baseball and the tradition and all the players that have come before me, but then I'm just – Realizing it's the entire athletics was that's why the little shot came to me. But uh, it's such an honor. I think I got. I'm trying to think of who I got the text from. Is from, I don't know. I can't even find it right now. Is is someone? I, I'm not doing injustice, and I apologize for not remembering their name. Well, obviously, you, as you alluded to, you know, this is a baseball program that has so many talented legends over the years. MLBU for a reason. Uh, then, as you mentioned, just the broader athletic department. So many legends that have come through Tempe over the years, just, you know, to be in that select group of the best of the best, just overall, how, how meaningful is it for you? And as you mentioned, you know, to be able to do so and just kind of that your two years as a Sun Devil. It's, it's very meaningful because uh, I grew up and I played the game as a fan. So I was very observant of who came before me, uh, what went on before me and uh, where I was in my career at all times. I had awareness of it. So I knew when I was at Arizona State, I knew about uh, the Barry Bonds, the Pedroyas, the Ethiers, the Laducas, the names go on and on. Um, and so I knew kind of what it meant to put on that jersey and now to be considered one of the all times with them. Uh, yeah, it, it'll set in a little bit more kind of when the ceremony and all that stuff hits. But right now, it's just uh, an awesome feeling. Now, you know, let's go back to the beginning of your time in Tempe. You know, these days transferring is uh, far, far more common than it was back in your day. But, you know, of course, you know, coming over from Kentucky after that 2007 season, what were some of the reasons that you, you caused you to kind of look elsewhere outside of Kentucky and ultimately what made ASU the right place and right fit for you? <laughs> well, I can't give you the full rundown of the reasons why uh, I was looking elsewhere. And the shortest thing, let's say uh, – I was forced to look elsewhere. Ah. I'll put it that way. <laughs> you know what? We'll just say I was kicked off Kentucky twice. Uh, as I tell people now, the beautiful butterfly before you needed some years in a cocoon to mature a little and to grow up. And uh, you wouldn't necessarily think Arizona State was that place to mature. But uh, as a homebody and someone who didn't go out much and uh, all that stuff, uh, Arizona State got me out of my shell. And um uh, to rewind a little bit, I looked at other places. Uh, I wanted a warmer weather than Kentucky. I knew that's where I wanted. I looked at places that needed help in the outfield who were losing guys to the draft, and I almost sent it to Arizona State as a joke because they were so good. And somehow that email that I sent recruiting myself to other places turned into a phone call, and phone call turned into, uh, I believe, a book scholarship. Before I had even seen the campus, I said yes, and I was there. <laughs> Well, Kentucky's loss is certainly ASU's gain. Uh, now, when going back to your playing days, you know you were known for an energetic play style. Uh, I believe uh, Andy Stankowitz once said that he plays the game with his hair on fire every night. Was that something that was just kind of natural for you, or was that something that, uh, that kind of developed over time? You know what? It was a perfect mixture of the way I was brought up and raised to play the game, the hard 90. Uh, it's just like even if you ground out, let out your energy, bit a pissed off sprint, just blow some steam on that stuff. And you know what? That's the best way to do it anyways because that, that'll force the most mistakes on the other team. And then you add in Pat Murphy, who was my coach at the time there, and he loved to play that way as well and uh, to kind of force the opposition into mistakes and never be out hustled by anybody and never uh, never back down to a challenge. So I think once I combine my way with his, I think that's really what set me up to catapult me for the rest of my career even. Now talking about Murph, you know, how, what kind of impact did he have on you? Not, you know, not just during your time in Tempe, but for the duration of your baseball career. Well, rewinding like I said, coming from Kentucky, uh Murph gave me my second chance in my life and I, I didn't uh waste it. Um so I owe a lot of that to him, a lot of credit to him. Um he he 
he wants you to become the best version of yourself. That's how he coaches. He pushes you, and uh, he's one of those guys where you might think he's he's being an asset to you at, at times, but at the end of the day, and your last game's over, or something like that, and you just look at him with nothing but just like you're you're thankful. You're like you really brought the best out of me, and you pushed me to be the best version of myself, and you just. So I, I do a lot of him, and I stayed in touch with him throughout my entire career. I still stay in touch with him now um, uh, for all those reasons that I mentioned before. I, I thought he, I was a better person around him because of him, so why not continue that relationship going for as long as I can? You know, aside from Murph, you know, who else were some of the most influential people during your two years in Tempe that helped kind of pr- propel you to the success that you had in the Maroon and Gold and also during your pro career? You know what? I had a great team. Obviously, like I got real lucky. I come from Kentucky, transfer over, and they're the preseason number one team. So I hadn't played probably that caliber of baseball or with those caliber of players yet. So the the Mike Leakes, the Ike Davis, Brett Wallace's, Kyle Rollins, Petey Paramores, those guys uh, were solidified already in the lineup and as great Pac-10 players. Um, so I got to look up to them and become – Best friends with them, even still to this day. I stay in touch with a lot of them. Um, so they had a good impact on me because they kind of taught me how to be a, a Sun Devil and how to play like a Sun Devil and what it meant. So I could just kind of follow in their footsteps right there, and they made it easier on me. And uh, then you go down the line, and Travis Buck, uh, who is the assistant coach there now, was – uh, in Cleveland with me during my rookie season. It kind of took me under his wing for a lot of this stuff. So I, I immediately gravitated towards my Arizona State connection in the big leagues and used that to my advantage because I just kind of stayed in his shadow until I was ready to come out of it. And um, you, you you don't have to look far in, in the major leagues to find another <laughs> Arizona State player, though. So that was, that was the nice thing. It's the dream of every college baseball player to get a chance to play in Omaha, and you definitely did that with the Devils in uh, 2009. What was that experience like for you on that legendary stage and you know, ultimately kind of proved that to, as the, uh, the final games of your college career? Uh, my experience was that I hate the University of Texas for the rest of my <laughs> life, probably. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you know what? I, I don't – I think a lot of people – I'm in the majority here. I don't know really why they changed – the, the stadium, um, I was probably the second to last year in the old uh, Rosenblatt. Um, I absolutely adored that stadium with the colors and the and energy and everything. Um, so, and I got to go with uh, Calhoun. Cole Calhoun was my college roommate, and um, we, we had a blast there. I faced off against my first day there was against the – I was a second rounder in Cleveland. The first rounder of Cleveland was the starting pitcher for North Carolina, Alex White versus us. So, there's a lot of storylines coming to fruition there, and um, we just had a blast. It was a team we obviously wish we could have gone further, uh, but we there, we really didn't have much to hang our head on. We had a fantastic season. Now, all in all, you know, on and off the field, you know, what are some of your favorite and most cherished memories from your days in the maroon and gold? Uh, I, a little time has passed, so maybe they're a little hazy. I and mean, actually, if you ask me during those days, they might have been hazy too. But we'll see. Uh, <laughs> You, it, it's they become brothers to you. There's there's Murph had a way of really solidifying the bond of your team. You, whether you go through uh, the grind together every day, the six a.m. wake ups or practices, whatever it may be, um, you really become close with the guys on the team, and you realize you're fighting for the same thing and pulling on the rope together. So those are some of my better uh, experiences. And then you add Omaha and super regionals and all that kind of fun stuff, and it, it's hard to really not smile when you think back about it. And, of course, uh, second-round pick after collecting just about every uh, honor imaginable at the collegiate level, second-round pick. And then you get that call that every, every young boy dreams of. You get that call up to the, to the bigs. What was that moment like for you? Uh, I was at Burf's house, and I was waiting. Uh, I had to wait a little bit for Mike Leake to get drafted early on. And uh, I'm trying to think if Josh Spence went for me or not, too. You know the, you know the pitchers go first. Uh, but we were all sitting around. I think I feel like I went outside and just started playing. I, I like lost interest. I started playing basketball with Murph's kid outside and uh, just just kind of relax or uh, just wait because it's just going to be fun whenever it happens. Or you come back inside and you realize Cleveland calls you. And, uh, they're in the same division as my hometown, Chicago. So I realized that not only would I get to play Chicago, but I get to play in that city for a bunch of times a year and. Uh, 
major league movies were out and popular and all that stuff so it's like a lot of fun things start coming to to the head but you also realize what kind of journey lays before you right when you get that call it's a very momentous day for you but it's also just the start and then eventually you know you get get up there and, and play at the major league level do you remember you know kind of the thoughts in your head when you're stepping into the box for that first a b as a major leaguer i really do um it goes fast, and you hear that, but it, it holds true. The first game goes fast just because you have so much adrenaline, so much energy, and you're trying to play the game as best you can, but you're also trying to take as much in as you can. So it's it goes fast. It gets blurry, but it's like the pitch is coming, and you're just so busy just soaking in the, the entire stadium and surroundings and playing in front of that many people. Um, it, it sucked to start. Probably, I think, started 0-7. Oh, for seven, excuse me. Uh, but in my first game, at least, I think I did, uh, I took a cutter off the shin, so I got to run to first base, and uh, like a one-legged pirate, I hopped my way to first base <laughs> and as, ha- as happy as I could be uh, because every every new thing you do from that point on was new to you and in the record books, and they can't take that away from you. They can't take that. My I have an on-base percentage now. I have... <laughs> Uh, got to run the bases, so it was really the coolest thing ever. Just anything you got to experience. I swung and missed. That was awesome. I did it in the big <laughs> leagues. Like everything becomes great. And then, of course, you know, over a, uh, ten seasons, you know, over eleven hundred total hits, one hundred twenty-six bombs, one hundred thirty-six uh, st- uh, steals at the major league level. Not to mention a couple of uh, all-star game appearances as well. How do you look back at your career as a major leaguer? You know what? I was always. Uh, I was never like the projectable guy. I was never the uh, one that stood out. I had to fight a lot to get to where I was. And, uh, I had to play like my, my hair was on fire because that was the only way I could stay. That was the best version of myself. That was the version that belonged in the big leagues. The other ones, if I ever lollygagged or took plays off or something like that, I just wasn't the same player and I wasn't good enough to be there. So And it would show. So I... Uh, was happy that I was able to lock in for that long. And uh, what comes from it, it comes from that effort and putting in that work and grinding for that long. The rewards are stuff like all-star games and playoff appearances and all these cool things that happen by really just putting your head down and uh, playing game by game. Instead of having it as a goal, You'll it just kind of comes to your plate with uh, your head down. Of course, you played with some big-time stars at ASU, a lot of guys who went on to huge success uh, like yourself at the Major League level. Uh, one of those guys became kind of a, a Internet sensation, a real great feel-good story earlier this season. Drew Maggi, when he got that big league call up to Pittsburgh after more than a decade in the minors, what was your reaction when you heard that news, saw the videos, all the love that, uh, that Drew yeah. was getting uh, you know, when he got his big chance? Well, if you've ever met Drew, you know why all the he was getting all the love. He literally is one of the more down-to-earth, humble guys. And uh, and I just talked about how much of a grinder I had to be in to get where I was. There's very few people maybe that I can look in the mirror and say, that guy might have grinded more than me. And Drew Maggi is one of those guys. Um, just an absolute baller, refusing to give up. I Because I can't tell you, I, I did not play in the minor leagues that long. I had a very fortunate situation in Cleveland where I moved up through the ranks fast uh, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can firmly say that I would have lasted that long in the minor leagues with all the bus rides and all that stuff as long as he did so uh, you just have to tip the cap to him and you're so happy he actually got there and got a hit and got RBIs and I know he's not done yet I'd like him to get some more uh, but I immediately texted him DM'd him I literally like I don't know if this is your cell anymore I don't know if this and I just <laughs> Any way I could reach out, I just wanted to know uh, how happy and proud I was of him. Now, of course, you know, you're know you being inducted into the ASU Hall of Fame, and there's uh, another one of those Hall of Famers that is at the helm of the program these days and, and Willie Bloomquist. Uh, what are your thoughts on him You know, kind of leading the Sun Devil baseball program, and you know, what value does it have to have a, a, an ASU alum, an a, a former player, you know, in that position? So as I got a little bit throughout, uh, it's the middle of my career, I do uh, – I. I'm trying to think if I played against Willie, maybe it was last year, might have been my first year or something. I don't know if we overlapped or not, but uh, talking to Murph and talking to some other guys, we kind of played the same way. We were kind of those dirtbag guys that uh, just love to get after it on a baseball diamond, and uh, I think he represents Arizona State about as well as anyone, so I was excited for him to get the job. 
Uh, I was over there before in some off seasons hitting in those cages. He was uh, gracious enough to allow some of the players to come back. And um, he's just, he's just a great dude. I know the program has been struggling for a little bit now, but I think he, and I, I firmly, firmly hope that he's the guy that's going to get us back there. I think his name when Travis Buck helping it too. Hopefully those two guys can uh, take us back to where that program belongs, but I'm a big Willie Pumpkins fan. Now, speaking of where that program belongs, you know, it's been a little bit since the Sun Devils have been back to Omaha. It uh, has. Yeah, what, what do you think the program needs to do to kind of, you know, get back to that blue blood status to become a perennial contender and a regular visitor to Omaha? Well, listen, I think the program and other people need to realize just how hard it is to a, get to Omaha. And that goes to show just how good we were for in the early 2000s and uh, 90s and all, all on back. Um, it's not easy to get there, even when. My first year, when we had probably had a better team than my second year, but we lost in the super regionals, and my second year still got there. I think you gotta you gotta recruit well. You can't miss out on those uh, high Arizona prospects. You don't want them leaving the state uh, for any reason. Uh, and I think you take the, the risk. I know Murph would like to take the risk on those first rounder, second rounder, projectable guys, where it's like, hey, if you don't get the number in the draft that you like. We, we want you coming here, and it happened maybe once or twice. It almost happened a couple more times, but uh, sometimes it, it doesn't work out where the draft doesn't work out for the way you want it, and they end up going to school for a few years, and you need to let those guys know that Arizona State's the best place for them to be. Earlier this year, you announced your retirement from professional baseball, so what does the future hold for Jason Kipnis? A lot of golf. <laughs> a, uh, a lot of golf as I'm in the car on the way back from around right now. Um, uh I have some restaurants and bars. Uh, some have started in the Columbus and Cleveland, Ohio area. The biggest one, though, is coming in Miami, the Wynwood, Miami area. We are opening up a huge kind of restaurant uh, nightlife time place, so we're putting a lot of time and effort into that. We've also gone back to school to fish. Um, and in the meantime, we've also picked up this podcast, this foul territory uh, that I'm on a guest host with like AJ Brzezinski, Todd Frazier, and some other guys, and maybe even a little broadcasting. So I think as I retired, I realized just how bored I could get with nothing to do. <laughs> and I said, I just can't, it's not, that's not for me, at least not yet. Uh, so we're, we're staying busy and uh, we're, we're, we're venturing into a bunch of different uh, places where we're not really comfortable, but I think that's beneficial to you to get outside of your comfort box. So we're going to be trying a bunch of our hands at a bunch of different things and See which ones we like, but in the meantime, throughout all that, golf will be consistent. <laughs> awesome. I'd lo love to hear the, the plate is full. Um, good luck with all, yeah. all the restaurants and bars out there. So, you know, last question for you. You know, obviously, so many great memories that Sunnival fans hold of your playing career, a bunch of honors and accolades, uh, the new title of ASU Hall of Famer. But ultimately, how do you hope Sunnival fans remember you? Someone who just came in and got it right away. Uh, because I, I, like I said earlier, I played as a fan of the game. Um, so I knew what it meant to put on the, the Sun Devil jersey right away. Um, I, I held them in very high esteem. And uh, I, I hope I played, I hope my play showed how much it meant to me to put on that jersey, whichever jersey I wore, but especially the Arizona State one. And I hope they remember me because I remember it as the place where that's how I learned to be Jason Kipnis, the baseball player, the major league player, too. So. I love that place. All right, joining the program now is one of our favorite people, and it also help, helps to, happens to continue a overarching theme of news always breaks on the days that we record. And so our next guest, you know him from his great work on Devil's Digest, but he's taken all that talent up to the Bay Area, back home. Jack Loader, welcome back to the show, and congratulations on the new job. Tell our listeners what you're up to. Thank you, Brad. Um, listeners of Speak of the Devils, readers of devilsdigest.com, a sincere shout out and thank you. Um, obviously, we, we wouldn't have our, our positions, our livelihoods without the people consuming our content. So I really appreciate everyone has interacted, um, even the Arizona fans. <laughs> it's always been a pleasure. Um, I'm going back home to the Bay Area. Um, I'm going to be covering some high school sports for a uh, up-and-coming publication called westcoastpreps.com, um, offering comprehensive football coverage in the fall, a lot of hoops in the winter, and baseball and softball in the spring. 
And I'm told there's some soccer and volleyball mixed in as well throughout the calendar when, whenever appropriate. So I'm looking forward to being very well-rounded in my coverage and uh, continuing to build more portfolio as, as, as a full-time kind of big boy adult now. So if you're proud of me, feel free to send me thanks because it's been a long time. Well, uh, congratulations once again. And uh, so the, the Bay Area is going to get a big boost. They're lucky to have you up there. And it looks like you'll be uh, staying busy with all those sports on your plate. And, of course, you know, you've been on the show a number of times, getting your expertise and insight into the baseball program for Arizona State. And obviously an uneven season. You, we've talked all season long about the highs and the lows, ultimately kind of fizzled out. So we're going to dive deep and get your insight into what exactly happened and what this program can do moving forward. So, of course, they fell short of making the postseason. Now, for any listeners out there who might be might have missed a couple of those episodes. I might not be completely in tune with the baseball program. Just how close were the Sun Devils to making the postseason this this year? Uh, they were as close as you can get, Brad. I mean, we don't know this for sure because we weren't in the room, but they were in the first four out. I truly believe they were probably team number 65 when they were filling out that bracket. Um, and obviously that's not to say they were the 65th best team in the country because you have all the auto qualifiers and everything. Um, but ASU, at the end of the day, was just on the outside looking in. And um, you can take issue with the way the committee went about things. I think a lot of ASU fans, more so than anything else, were upset at seeing Arizona get into the tournament, not ASU. Uh, the question of did ASU deserve to get in, um, as much as I think the committee did a poor job with the selection process, I don't necessarily think ASU should have gotten in based on what happened on the final Sunday of conference tournaments with bid stealers. I think that really kind of screwed ASU in the end. Um, it went from Sunday morning, me thinking, all right, they're going to squeak in once Arizona lost in the Pac-12 title game to, oh, damn, uh, Charlotte stole a bid and Tulane stole a bid. And all of a sudden it's really dicey. Um, ASU was really close, about as close as you can get. And I think if you told me at the beginning of the year that ASU was going to be the first team out, I would have said, okay, that's, not a, not a ringing success, but it's definitely not a failure. Uh, but based on the fact that ASU was ranked as high as number 13, you know, in mid, mid-April, I think it is a tough pill to swallow, as it should be, because ASU was playing incredible baseball, beating whoever was in front of them, in the conversation to host a regional, to be a national seed, a top 16 seed. And they couldn't do it. Not only that, it became um, obvious they weren't going to do that. And it deteriorated to the point of them putting themselves in the bubble and at the end of the day, it's a very accountable group. Um, they did it. They did it to themselves. But you can also point to a few things here and there and say, "Ah, this has gone differently." Take issue with the committee, but a dis- a very disappointing end to a season that had a lot of momentum and highs. Now we'll get into the, the exact details here in, in a second, but just kind of in a broad, you know, ten thousand foot view sense. Given the failure to make the postseason, do you think this that 2023 was a failure for Sun Devil Baseball? No, not completely. I think certain element, elements of it were definitely a failure. I think if you just, in a vacuum, not making the field of 64 is a failure. But given the, the, uh, the momentum the team had all year, the big moments, they did sweep Arizona at home. They took two or three from Oregon State. Um, they played a big series at Mississippi State. I think those non-conference series are going to be a hallmark of Willie Bloomquist that was never a hallmark of Tracy Smith, especially on the road. Um, a lot of things to feel good about, but yeah, a lot of things to really have a sick feeling in your stomach about as well, because when the chips were on the table in late April and in the first half of May, ASU really kind of fumbled down the stretch against the best teams. And there's definitely something we said, I think Willie's still learning. Uh, my whole, the flag I flew last off season was that he's, a lot in his first season we're going to see a lot of improvements from him we did but I think he learned a ton more this season and especially in this final 12 to 15 games when ASU went from you know a one or two seed in a regional to on the outside looking in he's going to continue to gather information if I were an ASU fan which I guess technically I am now Brad is, is that the case kind of yeah you're you're not no longer on the beat so you're you can let that fandom flag fly I'm no longer on the beat I'm no longer a employee of Devil's Digest so Go Devils. I'm fired up about the way this baseball program is going. And uh, I think other ASU fans, including myself, should be really excited as well. All right. So, you know, kind of, you know, looking at the, uh, the in a po- like a post-mortem sense, you know, 
what were the underlying factors of that late season collapse that ultimately cost the Sun Devils the postseason? So in a very simple way, they went from playing the worst teams in the Pac-12 to playing the best teams in the Pac-12. Um, so you'd expect some natural regression to the mean in the form of not, you know, not being, not winning every series. They'd won every series up until April 29th to, to May 1st series at Oregon. Um, they had take, they had swept, as like I said, swept Arizona, swept Washington State, taking two or three from Cal on the road, uh, taking two or three from Utah on the road. Uh, you expected them to kind of come down from that high when the schedule slipped to Oregon, Stanford, USC, and UCLA. But the precipitous fall that we witnessed, specifically in the Oregon, Stanford, and USC series, was pretty shocking. And I think a big reason for that was just a the difference being not that ASU wasn't talented enough. I think experience was a big thing. A lack of quality depth in the bullpen and arms, especially on the starting front, was a big thing. But you look at all those losses. They lost close games in Oregon, although they were high-scoring and kind of ugly games. They lost three pretty close games against Stanford. It was a two-run loss, a one-run loss. And then the Sunday game, when they, they were swept by Stanford, the Sunday loss was a five-run loss, but it was a one-run game going into the top of the ninth inning. So they hung all the way with Stanford, who was the number eight overall seed, and uh, just was eliminated yesterday in Omaha. Um, and then lost three games at USC in almost inexplicable fashion, where the entire problem of the, of the two weeks prior completely flipped, and instead of uh, getting out slotted, ASU was blanked at the plate in a way that was probably excruciating for fans and I know was frustrating and kind of puzzling for me. Um, they were close games, but at, in the end of the day, the lack of depth on the mound and a lack of quality starting arms that were able to put together full seasons was really disappointing considering the depth on paper they brought in and that how that depth performed in the first part of the season. On the flip side, what were some of the bright spots that stood out to you most about this uh, past season for the Devils? Um, young talent, Luke Hill, New Contratus, Isaiah Jackson. I'm probably forgetting some others. Uh, but the young guys at the plate were awesome for ASU. Um, the pitching was better, believe it or not, because 2022 was so bad. And a lack of blown games, I think, was a big, just emotional, emotionally settling fact for ASU fans. In 2022, they lost so many games late. They blew, I think it was seven saves. Not all those that resulted in losses, but they lost so many leads in the ninth inning. And this year, they were so good in that respect. The back end of the bullpen, for the most part, was really good. So I think being fundamentally sound, when they lost, they lost because they got beat. It wasn't because they gave it away most of the time. So I think you can point to those tangible things as, uh, as points of prosperity and hopefulness for the future that you saw in 2023. You know, unfortunately, kind of injuries derailed his last couple seasons. So really hard to blame for uh, former All-American Ethan Long for entering the transfer portal and maybe taking a look at a fresh start elsewhere. How big will this, this loss be if he does, in fact, uh, head elsewhere? And any idea where he might land? Well, it's hard, to, it's hard to say how big the loss would be because he hasn't been on the field a whole lot since that freshman year. He went and got the surgery done last summer on the wrist after missing the last 10 or 12 games and really being hampered for most of the season because of that wrist injury. And he re-aggravated, and I think it was game 11 or 12 of this season. So a lot of question marks surrounding Ethan Long and what his Sun Devil career could have been, which is really disappointing because of how amazing that freshman year was, how good of a guy he is, how much he cares about winning and how much he cares, or I probably should say cared about winning in, in these colors. Um, like you said, Brad, I can't really blame him for going in the portal. Oftentimes when you've had so much tumult, and just frustration in one location, it could be that he just needs to change the scenery. I've heard nothing about any strife or, or any sort of uh, disagreements or contentiousness with retention, I guess is the word there. Sorry, I, gotta, I should probably brush up on my English with the, uh, with the coaching staff here or any teammates. So I think it's no bad blood. He probably just wants to change the scenery. Um, and I really have no, no big idea where he could go. I know he was an Arizona commit early in his high school days, so I guess that's not completely off the table. Um, that's probably the only destination I think that would really piss off ASU fans is if he went south. I wouldn't put my money on that, though. 
Uh, he might stay in the pack. He might go south. He really liked Thomas Early, was a hitting coach of the Tracy Smith staff, and Early's now at Texas A&M. So if Ethan thinks he can get a, a uh, opportunity at Texas A&M, that could be an attractive destination. Obviously, Tracy Smith flipped it from Arizona, and Tracy Smith's at Michigan now, so keep your eye on that. Other than that, I have real, really no intel. Um, Ethan and I have a good relationship, but he hasn't been in my ear exactly about his process, which, you know, I can't blame him for, so... I wish him the best going forward. I think all Sun Devil fans should be on his side because he's experienced a lot of hardship on and off the field in the last couple of years. You know, a handful of other players uh, entered the portal along with Ethan Long, most notably Will Rogers, which can't be considered too big of a surprise. Uh, on the flip side, the kind of the good news is there haven't been any real surprises so far as who have uh, announced their intention to you know jump in after that kind of initial first wave. Uh, do you think that ASU fans should still hold their breath about any kind of key players? possibly jumping in the portal at, at a later date? Or do you think that the main guys that are scheduled to return are still fully committed to this program? Based on what I've seen and based on what I've talked to, it looks like the portal hall that's in there right now is probably going to be pretty much what uh, the extent of it, which is awesome news for ASU. Um, that could change based on who they bring in. If a player feels you know their spot is really threatened by an addition, maybe they'll jump in the portal. But again, usually that wouldn't be a super key guy anyway. So I think what you've seen right now is what you got. Um, a noteworthy one is Ryan Hanks, who was a freshman pitcher this year, did not get a ton of innings. Uh, Sam Peraza and the coaching staff was really excited about him. In January, coming out of winter break, they were saying, this guy's really good. He's going to get some innings. We're really excited about him, and it never really materialized for him. Same thing with Austin Humphrey, the freshman pitcher. So ASU continues to struggle to recruit high school pitchers and bring in homegrown pitchers. Most of the pitchers who got consequential innings this year were guys they picked up in the portal. So I think their ability to recruit high school pitchers, develop high school pitchers, and not have to go get you know rental players every year is going to be really important for longevity of this program. Um, so looking at keeping that portal uh, window coming in and limiting it coming out, I think it's really important um, to expand on that a little bit. I was worried about Luke Hill being threatened, especially being a, a kid from the South, being enticed by some SEC offers. So far, so good there. I think he really loves this program. I know for a fact he loves Willie Bloomquist, and uh, I think he's really passionate about winning at ASU, so he looks safe at this point. And uh, no other huge movement, but ASU's ability to recruit high school pitchers is going to be paramount and not having to rely on the portal going forward. Kind of leads in perfectly to the next question, because collectively – uh, under Willie Bloomquist, it's been two seasons of bad pitching. The ERA uh, as a team was better than the two seasons ago, but still not great. Still, you know, pushing six. How much do you think this is kind of like a, a talent versus coaching or development issue? I think the talent's there and the coaching development is there. I just think there's so much talent and so much. There's, it's such a razor thin margin in college baseball between wins and losses, especially out west the style of baseball that's played in the Pac-12 in recent years. And I think, like I said, Willie Bluquist is learning. Sam Peraza is coming along as a recruiter and a pitching coach. I know there's noise about his status as pitching coach when the pitching cost him a lot of games again this year, albeit, like I mentioned, not as much as last year. Um, the talent's there. I think being able to put it together in a second full off season and really just executing, it comes down to execution, right? At the end of the day, you can have the talent, you can have the coaching. What happens from first pitch to last pitch is what's going to win the games. And when it came down to it this year, ASU did not win those games. They were right there. Uh, you can see the bottom fell out, but it's a ton of close losses. So being able to flip those results is uh, more on the players than on the coaches, I think. Although Willie Bloomquist is an incredibly accountable guy. And you're not going to hear him making excuses. So it's a little bit of both. And uh, it just comes down to executing in big moments. Now, we knew when Willie Bloomquist took the job that there was a lot of work to do to get this program back to the historical standard that it had and so many fans still cling to. Now, through these two years under Bloomquist, is Centerville Baseball kind of where you think they should be along that process, or do you think that they're perhaps ahead of schedule or even behind schedule? I think it's right around schedule. Um, there are a lot of positives, like there's some recruiting momentum, I think uh, they're making it more of a of an attractive destination, especially for pitchers. Um, but based on on-the-field performance, I think Willie would be the first guy to tell you that the results of these first two seasons um, are not up to snuff in terms of win-losses and postseason status. Obviously, they missed the tournament the last two years. 
And, you know, if you said that 15, 20 years ago, that ASU would miss back-to-back tournaments and not even make the field of 64 in back-to-back years, it would sound crazy. So still a lot of work to do to get the program back to where Willie, where it was when Willie was a player and where he wants it to be under his tutelage. If you're a Sun Devil fan right now at this point, what are your top three reasons for optimism for 2024? Luke Hill, New Contratus, Isaiah Jackson, and uh, Ryan Campos, Jacob Tobias, and those guys. I mean, you got a lot of production at the plate. Um, you got a good coaching staff. You got a passionate coaching staff. And I think this team and the returners, especially, are going to have a really, really bad taste in their mouth from the way this season ended. And I think that's going to propel them. So count on these guys to play with a chip on their shoulder. Count on them to be a a little bit pissed off or maybe a lot bit pissed off with the way things came down the stretch. So I think the talent's going to be there on the field. It's whether or not they can channel that frustration and that perceived slight into on-field results and really sustain the on-field results, right? It's not about winning in February and March. It's about winning in April and May. It, you know, right now is, uh, you know, we're hitting in the uh, summer college world series going on, but for the Sun Devils, it's the off season. What are the top things that should be on Willie Bloomquist's offseason to-do list? Recruit the heck out of some high school pitchers and do it locally, do it in California, do it in Texas. Um, get guys in who are built, or you're going to develop as freshmen, and by the time they're juniors, you're going to be front line arms. I think this program is starved for some starting pitching. Um, if Willie feels like he needs to make some changes on his staff, I think he shouldn't be afraid to do that, right? He's, he's a guy that has... Tons of connections in pro ball. Um, being the 13, 14 year MLB vet he was, he knows coaches who can coach every specific part of the game. So I think he should be really aggressive in kind of trying to add to his staff. And, you know, it's not hard to convince people to move to, to Tempe or Scottsdale, right? It, it can be hard for some other coaches to convince people to move to Corvallis or to Pullman, Washington. But hey, if you say, hey, let's, why don't you go live in Scottsdale and come help me coach? I, I've always thought that that should be an advantage for uh, not just recruiting players, but recruiting coaches. Um, so I think Willie should make changes if he thinks he needs to. There's a lot of momentum in the staff currently, but I don't think he should be scared to make some changes if need be. Um, maybe not as much of a massive portal haul of last season, but you got to hit the portal hard every offseason. That's the case with every college sport right now. So don't sit back on your heels. Uh, go do what you need to do. Start in pitching. Um Maybe some coaching changes, maybe not, although I feel like that may have been already addressed if he was going to make major changes. And uh, look for some impact freshmen to make it uh, a difference again. Now, it might be a little bit too early to speculate as to what needs to happen in 2024, but we'll just dive in, do it anyway. So after two years without a postseason appearance, what kind of outcome next year do you think will be satisfactory enough for this fan base, and, and you know, obviously it's a very passionate Sun Devil baseball fan base, to believe that the program is in good hands and in headed, headed in the right direction? Well, I mean, coming into this season, I said they got to make the tournament to feel like it was a success. They didn't do that. I think there's successful elements, but overall, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call the 2023 season a full success. So uh, 2024, the pressure turns up even more. You have to make the tournament. You absolutely have to get into that field of 64 and um, just show people that you're playing in regionals you're back on the map and you're making noise. So on a simple note, get back to that tournament. Um, you know, a more intangible note, don't st- stick with the strength in the bullpen. Uh, don't blow games. Don't blow leads. Get out to early leads. Keep hitting home runs. Keep scoring runs at a high clip, especially at home in a stadium like that. Um, but, yeah, overall, ASU needs to be playing postseason baseball in 2024. Well, Jack, as always, appreciate you taking the time to give our listeners the insight and expertise into Sun Devil Baseball, and hopefully everyone will be following me on Twitter at JackLoader underscore with your new endeavor with West Coast Preps. A lot of exciting things out there. Always love you having the show. I, I, I don't think this will be the last time you, the uh, dulcet tones of Jack Loader grace the airwaves to speak of the devils. But uh, as always, Jack, thank you so much. It better not be the last time. I, I get to come on as a fan now, so uh, <laughs> give everyone my best. Sun Devil fan, it has been an honor, and, and I guess now I'm one of you, for better or worse. And from what I've seen from you guys, that seems like a pretty pretty miserable existence. So hopefully hopefully things turn around here on the football field, basketball court, and in my area of expertise, the baseball field. All right, so you just heard from Jack Loader talking about the Sun Devil baseball season that was and uh, some of the things that are 
up ahead for Willie Bloomquist as he's going to enter his third year with a lot of expectations and, and it was just kind of a you know an always something university type of season. Just the the, the uneven start, a very strong kind of like middle, and then just kind of the inexplicable kind of collapse at the end in terms of just you know how like things that were the offense that was hitting couldn't score against USC. I mean the pitching was always kind of struggling throughout the year, and then just kind of the added twist of the knife for ASU fans of U of A sneaking their way into the tournament. But uh, overall, you know, this we knew that this was going to be a, a process for Sunville Baseball, and it's going to be a tough job for Willie Bloomquist kind of coming in after the Tracy Smith era and kind of getting ASU baseball back to that perennial Pac-10, 12 type of contender, uh, let alone, you know, a, a team that can perpetually make a run at Omaha. But uh, Joe, overall, like, given your preseason expectations, you know, when we did the episode with Willie, the thoughts that you had about what this baseball team could do. You saw what ultimately happened, kind of the, you, teasing everybody so much with like from potential regional host to out on the outside looking in. Do you feel it was kind of a disappointment in its entirety? I, I think that you have to label that. And I would anticipate that, you know, everyone within the program would agree. Um, you know, there are shades of gray with that. It, you know, label it an outright failure. Are you going to label it just disappointing? I, I think disappointing is certainly a way to, to describe it, and that's not you know by any means a cheap shot or anything like that, because I don't think that there's anybody affiliated with the program that has any level of satisfaction in not making the postseason. I mean, that's just a simple outcome right there. Uh, now then, the forest for the trees. You know, you certainly saw improvements year over year on you know micro levels or just a greater influx of talent and youth and that sort of thing there were a lot of um, issues that reared their head in frustrating ways whether it was you know inconsistencies with pitching or fielding errors that were costly that sort of thing Um, so yeah it's you know it's it's a tough thing to you know, really summarize in a very detailed way. It's easy to to, to broad stroke it, of course, but you know, you, I still feel comfortable saying that there were levels of improvement. And my goodness, I mean, it's it's it is incredibly frustrating that I mean, ASU probably only had to be one, you know, a couple games away from a very different outcome. You know, it's not necessarily something where they. You know, had to have won ten more games than they did. I mean, it's you could probably isolate a few individual games that would have made a massive, massive difference in the team's postseason uh, prospects there. Uh, because yeah, as you're talking about, I mean, there were points where the conversations we were having after that Oregon State series about this be- this team being very much for real. This is a team that spent a solid chunk of time in the top 25 of all the various polls across the course of the season. So this isn't a team that was a seller dweller for the entirety of the season. It just things hit the skids at the worst possible times in very bad ways that ended up being very costly. So it certainly is very frustrating there. It's like we talked with Jack about, you know, in an earlier show, like there's a substantial difference in just simply making the postseason. Like if the roles were reversed and it was ASU that got in and not U of A, and even if ASU would have gone to and barbecue, that is a different feel yeah. for the fan base than having not gotten in at all. So that just puts a lot of, you know, it does increase the pressure for next season. Um, it very likely increases the expectations. Now, hopefully, the fan base remains patient enough to continue to support things. Uh, you know, ASU obviously proved that they can get high-level talent from the transfer portal. They can, they can bring in high-caliber freshmen. I mean, think about virtually every contributor from this past season, either was a true freshman or a member of the transfer portal. You know, with the exception of the likes of, you know, Jacob Tobias, Ryan Campos, that sort of thing. I mean, the vast majority of guys were ones that were new to the program this past year. So if you can continue that. If you can prevent key players from leaving via the transfer portal, I mean, I think this program could take some big steps and things can get onto the track that was hoped for and expected. But yeah, looking back on the season, man, it is, 
you know, it's frustrating. And I'm sure it's the, the, that's the same thought that anybody that's closely connected to the program would have because you saw some glimpses of, once again, there was a run there where we thought this team could make some major noise. And then you had, had stretches where, you know, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. So um, the, the path is in front of them. The work to do is understood. And that's just where the coaching and the recruiting and development come in uh, because 2024 for Willie Bloomquist and company, I mean, that's going to be completely goes without saying a pivotal, crucial, urgent year. Yeah. And I don't necessarily maybe think it rises to the level of like referendum year, but like you better see some postseason baseball in Tempe uh, in some, some form or fashion. And I, I, I do agree with your point that like, ASU just slips one game on that on that uh, conference schedule. You know they're in the tournament and just every everything, regardless of the, you know how that they would have performed in regional. I think just the, the whole tenor of the offseason conversation is much different. But you have a great core of young players. You know Luke Hill jumped out to me immediately last year, and he you know, he's a real cornerstone player along with other guys. You know Ryan Campos, one of the best hitters in America. You get uh, you get Nick McClain for an entire year. Yeah, I mean that guy's. Yeah. Player of the year, conference player of the year material. Yeah, yeah Isaiah Jackson. I mean, just you know, the, the guys that are coming back in that core of that lineup. But you know, to me, it's gonna. You know, I've harped on it, and I don't you know necessarily want to sound like a broken record, but like the pitching just has to get so much better. And you know, there were some injury issues, but ultimately, like when you you figure, you know, you shave a run off the team ERA from a year ago, you think you're doing all right. But when when it was seven to start with, and it's six this year, still not good, and it still let ASU down far too often. Um, I mean, this is a place that uh, you really sh- should have a lot much, a lot better pitching. When like, you don't want to have to put yourself in a position where you have to score, you know, eight, nine, ten runs a game uh, to stay competitive, to, to you know, be a, a viable conference contender. That's got to get better. Sam Peraza, uh, you know, is a quality pitching coach, but he's got to start developing those guys. And you know, you can only blame injuries so far. So we'll see what they're able to do in the, the transfer portal and bringing up a lot of uh, young or uh, and signing some. Uh, young, talented high school arms in in that uh, that uh, ballpark are, but it's just it's just the pitching for me. Just like like in in baseball in general, you're going to go as far as, as your pitching staff can take you, because uh, you know the, the bats you can't count on every night, uh, hitting you know scoring all all that kind of uh, put up those kind of offensive numbers. But you know ASU does have a great young, solid offensive core to come back and build around there. Just I want to see them really kind of revamp the staff again. You know, if they can take another another runoff uh, of the team ERA next year, that might be you know getting into something that uh, they can uh, become a, a little bit more dangerous overall and more balanced of a team. But uh, you know, this is going to be a very important year up ahead because you cannot absolutely absolutely cannot have three straight years without postseason baseball for the Sun Devil program. Yeah, and I know that the the large bulk of their you know, high school and junior college signing class, a lot of arms in that. And, you know, we'll see what shakes out as far as the draft is concerned. And if you're thinking about the, you know, the position players that return from this year, you know, you don't have a lot of draft eligible players that you expect to lose. Luke Keishel being, you know, one of the few. You just have a lot of guys that are simply not draft eligible. So as long as you can keep them away from that transfer portal, you can bring in, bring back rather, most if not all of you know your position players, so that you don't necessarily need to hunt for those guys from the transfer portal, and you can just really sink your teeth, go all in on you know a lot of arms, uh, because yeah, that's that's basically just what they need if they can just click the dial a, a little bit. I mean, this this program, it may seem on the outside looking in that they're far away because maybe the casual fan sees two consecutive seasons without postseason appearances. But I mean, I just don't think that they're that far away from being a you know very successful program within this conference. I mean, other than, other than Stanford right now and Oregon had a good run, um, you know, you don't have a lot of teams that are playing that played massively consistent wall-to-wall baseball you know Oregon State was up and down UCLA had a down year Oregon Oregon was a little streaky Washington came on at the end so you know there's just this dog fight for uh, some high level positions within the conference and obviously things are gonna shake out differently as you get USC and UCLA out of town um, so again like I said I, I don't think that this program is 
light years away from being into a a satisfactory spot for a lot of fans, but that is going to take work on the recruiting and development end, and it's going to be largely based on acquiring more pitching and also keeping the position players that are on the roster, because as is the case with every collegiate sport these days, you not only have to recruit players from high schools and junior colleges and other teams, but you pretty much have to re-recruit your own players on a regular basis to make sure they stick around. And that's going to do it for this episode of Speak of the Devils. I'd like to thank our great guests, Jack Loader, Jason Kipnis, Sean McDonald, Dylan Tapley, and Canyon Floyd. Uh, it is the doldrums of the offseason, but it is anything but dull for Sun Devil Athletics. So Joe and I will be hitting you up on your podcast feeds here shortly. A lot of great, exciting stuff that is in store for you uh, and all things Speak of the Devils. And make sure that you are following us on social media. You can find us on Facebook on Twitter at SOTD Podcast, on Instagram at Speak of the Devils, and give me a follow on Twitter and Instagram at BDenny29. And you can follow me at Joe Healy42. A huge shout out to our incredible sponsors, of course, including DeFalco's Deli at 2334 North Scottsdale Road. You can look them up online at DeFalco'sDeli.com. Cactus Sports which you can visit at 514 South Mill Avenue in Tempe or online at cactussports.com and do some shopping preparation for the seasons up ahead to get your gear in before everything gets started. Devilsdigest.com, a lot going on. We always say it because it's always true. A lot of recruiting, transfers. Before you know it, fall camp's going to be here in a little over a month or so. So you got to be locked in. Become a subscribed member of Devil's Digest so you can know everything that's going on as soon as it does or even in many cases before it happens. Jones Auto Group, huge shout out to our wonderful friends there. You saw some things about them. Hode Rubino did an awesome interview with our guy Parker Jones about uh, not only just the service they provide on a regular basis but how deeply involved they are in supporting Sun Devil Athletics from the NIL perspective. I've referred a few very close friends to uh, Jones Auto Group. They uh, made some purchases that they're very happy with. They're thrilled with the service they got. This is not just an advertising thing with us. I I can't stress it enough. If you want to support a Sun Devil-owned and operated business and, and one that is just very, very passionate, not only about the Sun Devil athletics, the athletes, but also all fans and alums, check out Jones Auto Group. And, uh, of course, major thank you to Spaghetti Shack. You can visit their four locations, so their traditional one there over on the the McClintock-Guadalupe area, the one near campus as well, 922 East Apache Boulevard, summer hours from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. If you are up in the cool, cool area of the Pine Top uh, Lakeside area in the northeast corner of the state, you can check them out at 592 West White Mountain Boulevard up there. And then also the Queen Creek location that you heard us talk about several times over the course, especially of last football season, that Ghost Kitchen at Bar Vigneto. That's up there at 7215 South Power Road. So the Spaghetti Shack, love to see expansion, all the success in the world we hope for them. We're very grateful to be partnered with them. You can check them out at thespaghettishack.com. To check out their locations, their hours, their menu, all that good stuff. And last but not least, a very, very sincere thank you to Sundival Family Charities. We always encourage you to check them out, support them as you can. Anytime you support them, anytime you give anything to them, support them in any conceivable way, what you're doing is you're helping the Sun Devil community because Sun Devil Family Charities, what they do is they raise money. They're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. They help those within the Sun Devil community who have financial needs due to medical conditions. So you're you're helping your own by supporting them. Check them out. Check them out at sundevilfamily.org. Check them out on... uh, We we share a lot of their stuff on Instagram as well. They're having the regular cornhole tournaments uh, that you can win some money, you can support the charity. So just keep tabs on what they're doing and support them when you can. And once you're done supporting our amazing sponsors, drop us a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice. We we'll really appreciate it, and we'll, Joe and I will be back in your feeds very soon with some more Sun Double Talk. Get to do the summer. <laughs>